now live. Thank you, uh, Ms. Moisten. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, and uh, I am going to uh, call the meeting of the CSWG for April 21st, um, 1921 to order. Start with a roll call of the membership. And I'm just gonna go around the screen. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones. Here. Welcome, Ms. Ferreira. Here. Ms. Walker. Here. Welcome, Ms. Bowman. Here. Ms. Pat. Here. Um, Ms. Owen. Here. Is that everybody? Mr. Cage is not on right now, correct? No, I do not see Mr. Cage, and he's not in the attendees either. Okay. Okay. Thank you all, and, and good evening. Um, and good evening to uh, folks who may be uh, attending this meeting from the community. I, I see we have a few people here. I want to pre-acknowledge the fact that we do have uh, uh, at least one member of our consulting group on, uh, in, in, in attendance here. And um, I want to thank them ahead of time for, for their work. I'm just going to quickly go through the uh, agenda for tonight. And you know, with the, with the group's per, uh, permission, I would like to first thank um, uh, Ms. Moisten for continuing to uh, articulate our minutes, uh, both on the website and to our meeting. And we have a few um, items, uh, uh, a few minutes items on there to approve. But uh, with respect to the time and starting late, I'd like to uh, postpone those to the next meeting and uh, go forward with just an overview of what our meeting is going to be for tonight. And um, uh, and, and go from there. Uh, so typically, for those of you who may be viewing for the first time, I, I think some of you may not be viewing, but our agenda is going to be, uh, it's going to start with reports and comments. And in, in that particular segment of our meeting, we do the public comment segment, which we, where we allow and welcome certainly people from our community to make comments to this committee uh, uh, within the opening of the meeting. We as a group typically listen and welcome your comments. We don't engage, but we do take your, your, your comments and input very seriously and integrate it into our thinking as a group. Um, in addition to that, I will open it up to our members of our, our, our working group who may at from time to time have some opening comments that they they want to make that have relevance to the, the work they're doing currently or relevance to the work that the community that the community safety working group is doing and we allow that to, to happen as well following that we're going to get into our our um the the, the meat of our agenda and that will be this evening a, a conversation with the Amherst Police Department. And at that point, I will uh, welcome them properly. And we will have a conversation about a motion that was created with respect to uh, community responders, the, our CREST program that we will discuss as well. In addition to that, um, we will cover upcoming events and uh, establish our next meeting date. And as always, if there are other items that are coming before the, the chair that did not get into the agenda, we'll consider those and make a determination on how to proceed with those particular items. And then we'll take the motion to adjourn. For all those in attendance, our uh, meeting uh, typically lasts two hours. We try to keep to that schedule as much as possible. And I just want to re-welcome everyone to us. Welcome, uh, Mr. Cage. Glad to see you're here. Glad you got in. Are you there? 
Yep, I'm here. Okay, I have one question for you real quick. How's school? Uh, it's doing good. I'm getting ready to go back in uh, next month, I think. Good. How's football? Uh, it was not not as planned. We we lost a lot of games, but uh, it was good good exercise. It was good fun. That's what we want to know. Are you having fun? Yep. Good. That's that's the bottom line. Glad you're here, and thank you for all your work. Thank all of you for all your work. And um, so uh, I want to open it up to our members of the uh, community safety working group. Any opening comments that are not agenda items, but uh, things you'd like to mention in, in advance of our discussion and, and action items? I'll just open it up to the group. You can raise your hand, I'll try to recognize you. Oh. Ms. Ferreira. So this is to our group, so you're skipping the public comment right now? Yes. You want our group first? Yes. All right. Yeah. I mean, me, you know, obviously I've, I've made some comments prior, you know, um, you know, this week it was the, the, the George Floyd, uh, the verdict uh, against uh, police officer Chauvin. Um, obviously, it's been a very tough week for everyone. Everyone was on pins and needles. In regards to it, I was on pins and needles. My kids, I have a 17 year old black male and an 11 year old son who are have been basically traumatized through this whole process. And uh, obviously we're very anxious about what we're going to inspire. Um, so now we're gonna see, you know, what's gonna come out of it. Obviously it's to still be vigilant. Um, you know, for, for me, thankfully there was a, a, a verdict that, that we were all expecting, um, but it's continue to be vigilant and uh, continue to think that we'll make, you know, some changes. Um, some positive changes. Uh, also, I did um, start reading the draft that the uh, seventh generation um, did a report on, uh, which I had a lot of good good information in there, um, just in terms of informing our work. But obviously, you know, the, the end of the day, it was just a very emotional week. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Appreciate the comment. Others of members of the group, uh, Ms. Bowman. Hi. Um, yeah. So it, I, I agree. It was very. It was, it's been a very trying week. Um, I refused, like I said last week, to watch the trial at all. Um, would get occasional updates from the news, but really even tried to stay away from that as much as I could. Um, and then I burst into tears when that verdict was, when the verdict was read and I held my breath as they, re as they read each account. Um, and I made my kids come and watch this, watch, watch the verdict as well. Um, because I, you know, even though they were like worried about it, like I was still like, we have to be on this, like everybody has to be on the same page with this verdict. And if it's not what we want to hear, like, like, it just sucks. Like, I had to prepare my kids that, you know what, you know, this is not the first time that police brutality was, like, filmed and that the police have got off. Like, they know about other cases, but they don't know, you know, they don't really know Rodney King, so, the Rodney King case so much. And so I was like, you know, you have to understand, like, if he if he if this man gets off it's gonna be bad and you know and then that's what I was holding my breath for because I was you know I saw the verdicts for the Rodney King case and and that was like and then I saw what the result of the verdict and that was really 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 hard for me and I think that a lot of that came up and I'm sure that a lot of that came up for a lot of people so as much as I am like sitting here being like thank god that is the verdict that came through i'm still extremely sad that one a life had to be lost for this and two um i definitely don't think he's gonna be, be handed down a sentence that seems like appropriate for what he did so yeah that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, 
thank you, and Ms. Ferreira. Um, Ms. Pat. Everyone, in addition to what Ms. Ferreira and Ms. Bowen said, um, as most of us, um, it's been a difficult week and month. And as a, as a, as a black mother that have um, five black children, three boys, and a black husband, black nephews, brothers, in-laws, um, I have just been numbed since yesterday. Um, I have not concentrated at work today. For me, it's not, I don't even feel like celebrating. Celebrating for what? Um, I, con I continue to ask myself, what will make a human being take somebody else's life? It's just beyond me. What puts hate in people is beyond me. So I'm struggling, let's put it that way. It, just like most people are. And then I just want to also comment on the work that the subcommittee, uh, budget subcommittee, uh, what we did um, this past weekend. Uh, we won't have enough time to discuss it tonight, but I just want to acknowledge uh, people that helped out. The, the subcommittee members, um, Ms. Alicia Walker and Ms. Brian Owen. Mm. I also, we also got substantive um, input from uh, Darius Cage and also from community members including Mr. Vince O'Connor, and thank you to the town manager. I have to bother you during the weekend to give me some formula, uh, to give us some formula about the budget. So um, I don't think we will have time to discuss it tonight, maybe next week, I could be wrong. I'll defer that to the chair and see what he says. Thank you. Um... I have a comment, but I will defer to my membership before, and I'll make last comment uh, before we go forward, unless there's another comment coming in. Ms. Walker. Um, hi, I just wanna echo what a lot of the other committee members have said. I apologize, um, background noise. Um, but I, I just want to echo what a lot of the other the committee members have said and feeling mixed emotions of relief with the verdict of the trial, but still feeling very much like this is very small baby steps. Um, I, like I went to sleep a little bit relieved and then woke up to the news of another young black child being killed at the hands of police. And so I just want to remind everyone that our work is far from over um, and that this is continuing to happen. And so that accountability, if that's what the verdict is, does not stop it from happening. And so we still have a lot of work to do. And I feel very thankful to be able to meet with you all every week to discuss these things with, with like-minded people. Um, so I just wanna thank you all for your time. Thank you for the comment and um... Uh, I don't know how we got another attendee in this meeting, but she's really cute. And that, that, that transformer was incredible. <laughs> okay, I want one. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, um, I would like to make a comment unless someone else on the committee would like to go before me, then I'd like to move into our action discussion items. Okay, thank, thank you all for, for your opening comments. And, and in, in light of this, um, um, if you, you haven't noticed or don't know me, I identify as an African-American man. I, I've been in the, the work around diversity and social justice for years. Um, and to see this verdict come through today is monumental. But in, re in reaction and response to what Ms. Walker and others are saying, um, I was kind of numbed by the decision. Numbed in this way, that uh, this is the first time in, in my lifetime that I've seen this kind of a verdict in this fashion go forward as it did. 
which, which said for me that one, we reached a, a different pinnacle with accountability. And this is just a moment of, of justice. The, the, there are a number of, of other places where justice needs to be served. There are a certain number of places where others think of other places where accountability has to be uh, called into play. And uh, I don't want to dwell on that as much as saying that while I, I have different feelings about that as an African-American man with, with four Black children who are all adults right now, we've had that conversation in our family. We've been having it for uh, a number of years, and we've had it since that, that verdict. I think what, what for me is, and I'd like to pass this on as hopefully an encouragement to folks who are working with me on the community is that um, we understand that how th this world works. We, we understand how systemic racism works. We understand that there, yes, there are good people and yes, there are bad systems that put good people in bad places. And I can tell you for experience that systems win. Systems win over good people. So I don't want to I don't want to dismiss that necessarily and to say like, hey, don't worry, you know, we're going to be good. But one of the things that, that the charge of our group is to look systemically as what, what is happening in Amherst. What what can we change in Amherst to make it uh, more just? What can we make it, how can we make it more safe? How can we make it more like a community that uh, is, is integrated and, and cross supportive and understanding of each other than what potentially is could or is happening within our own town. So I'm mixed like Ms. Pat said, I don't know how to respond to this. At one level, I'm, I'm excited about it. On one level, I'm saddened about it. And on the third level, which I'm at right now coming into this meeting is I'm energized by it. Because my, my energy tells me that this is, we are at a point as a community safety working group and in conversation with our community in conversation with our police department that we have an opportunity to make some sub substantive change uh, for all people, but particularly for BIPOC people. And I, I think this is our this is our moment, and I, and I hope we can stay the, the the course on this as a group, and and meet our charge. I am uh, hoping that happens, praying that happens, and bringing all the energy I can to that, even in a moment of of sadness and celebration, and everything all mixed together. Sometimes you just don't know how to react to that. So that that's my comment, and. Um, I, I appreciate all the energy that everybody on the screen and in our audience brings to this particular moment. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm happy that the, very happy that and to, to welcome the, um, the police department here to begin our conversation. So, I thought I saw a hand, but then it disappeared. I because I, I want to move to our 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 invitation to the police department to speak. If I missed something there, it was Miss Bowman? Was it you? I yeah, it was me, but I changed my mind, so it's it's fine. Okay, appreciate you all. Thank you, and uh, Miss Moisten. Mr. O'Connor is in the audience and has his hand raised. That's, that's going to be the next question. I almost forgot. I said, like, where is he? He's got to be there. Please acknowledge him and we'll welcome his comment. Hi, Mr. O'Connor. Welcome. Yeah, hi. So is this a appropriate time yes, to comment? Yes, it is. OK, so um, yeah. Um, um, so I, I guess my concern is that, you know, if, if you view the police killings of murders as a public health issue, you know, a subset of, of the gun violence, 
um, problem that the United States has, which, you know, that's a good way to look at it. Um, then um, <clears throat> convicting what amounts to maybe one, I mean, even though many officers are dismissed, but convicting one officer out of every hundred who commits murder um, for whatever reason, you know, every off every police involved shooting that's in inappropriate has got its own components. But convicting one out of a hundred and spending millions of dollars to do it, I think is needs to be viewed as as a as as a way to approach this situation that needs to be changed. We, we need to do prevention and prevention involves removing armed police officers from as many activities as possible in the community and putting up rigid controls over, you know, eliminating as much discretion as possible um, from police officers for the remaining activities for which we employ them. Um, prevention is what saves lives, not prosecutions. And, you know, just as with any other public health problem, you have to get to the source and eliminate the source of the pollution, you know, um, whether it's the pollution in a, a, a civil action, the book, or air pollution from, you know, in Louisiana that's endemic. And the, and the problem is you have, you have the police in every community in this country involved in too many things and the, and, and the police need to be barred from many of those things and the remaining things that they are engaged in, their conduct has to be strictly overseen and sub circumscribed so that there is no discretion when they stop somebody and so forth, no discretion. And, um, and this will eliminate people who, who act inappropriately. But anyway, I look forward to, you know, hopefully to the, to the reports of the, the two committees and, and to some very substantive change in, in uh, how the police department in Amherst conducts itself and, and the introduction of a new group of people who can deal with social problems in the town without guns. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I, I think I'd like to, to, to move forward right right now. Um, Ms. Moyston, unless there's, there are any other hands, I'd like to, to move forward and get going. We're good? Um, no, Zoe Crabtree has her hand raised and Lauren Mills had her hand raised first actually and then Zoe Crabtree. So I'm going to um, bring in Lauren. Did I miss them earlier in the comment? No. Or, so I don't know, Lauren Mills' hand went down. So Zoe Crabtree. Okay. Hi, Welcome to comment. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Zoe Crabtree. Um, I just wanted to say that I read through the draft motion that's in one of the versions of the agenda for today. And I know that you're going to be reviewing. This is the like, one of the main things on the agenda for this evening. Um, and I just wanted to uh, let you know that I'm really excited about it. Um, and I really hope that uh, we're able to make this program happen and that it can be fully funded so that it can be successful. So thank you so much for all of your work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any others, Ms. Uh, Ms. Moisten? Yes. Ms. Lauren Mills. Is there any others besides Ms. Lauren Mills? No. 
that will be the last one, but I'll take then I'll move to our action items because I want to invite our, our police department into the conversation. Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'll be quick. I um readings, I just wanted to um say that um being a resident of Amherst for about I can't even sometimes I can't can't remember the exact years, but it's been less than five years. Um, but I've always been a resident of um, Massachusetts and I've kind of gotten thrust into as all of us with, you know, these events that have occurred, you know, into activism and honestly, um, my first, um, like, jolt into like feeling like some change has to happen is when my son, mm -hmm. Um, was injured at school and the response to that injury. And so I am bringing that up because I feel like when things are not addressed, when small issues happen, this is why, you know, lives are taken, taken the way they are, um, you know, with just no, no conscious, no, no, um, no, no seeking of, you know, humanity. Um, and so I, I recently presented um, a survey with the school equity task force um, to the school committee and recommended that we declare um, systemic racism a um, health crisis. So I was hoping to just, again, share that with this group and also um, in the future with the Human Rights Commission so that um, we, can, <clears throat> we can move together and realize that, you know, as was said, systems are put in place that not one person can dismantle. And so we need to continue to work together um, the different entities in the town to really address um, systemic racism. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. So, so thank you. Um, I guess that's it, Ms. Ms. Moyston. <laughs> Yes, that's all. Okay, I I want to take a moment to um, uh, welcome our our Amherst Police Department. Uh, I want to welcome Chief Scott Livingstone, um, um, Officer uh, Ron Young, Officer uh, Gabriel Ting. To, uh, to this meeting. Uh, this, is, this is the meeting um, and an opportunity to, to begin a conversation um, with the department about their work and also how this work interfaces with what our charge is as, as a working group. And rather than going through the, the actual, the list of our charge, one of the things that this, this community service working group is charged with um, is to be able to examine all aspects of our community. And I'm generalizing here, but we are charged with one, taking a look very a carefully, a careful deep look in fact, at what is happening in our community with respect to policing with respect to potential alternative uh, safety initiatives we might take. And looking at currently what we're doing and where we are, our goal as a community, service, a community safety working group is to be able to recommend to the town manager um, and the town proposals for how we see community safety working in our community. I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, the Seven Generations Movement Collective is also uh, currently involved, even as we speak, 
in this kind of research in our community. They are outreaching to, to our community and um, getting information. I want to acknowledge the fact that we, this community safety working group has also been in contact with the Amherst Police Department prior to this conversation on two separate occasions to seek written information from, uh, from the department uh, and with the support of the, the town manager, which we've also received. But at this point, as we're starting to funnel down into proposals for what our budgets may look like, what proposals may look like, it would be uh, irresponsible, let me say that, for us to not include certainly the, the conversation with the police department. Um, I do wanna say that uh, it, it, it's almost, it, it's a little, odd that we're having this conversation with the police department at a time when we just came up with a big decision uh, at the uh, worldwide level around Dr. Chauvin. And uh, in full disclosure, I had a conversation with uh, uh, Chief Scott Livingstone about this earlier and uh, we shared our sentiments about this, but I think hearing from the police department at this particular time would be important. What you have to share with us, Chief Livingstone and members of your staff would be important for us to, to know. And what would also be important uh, for us is how we um, can interact with you as we go forward. We have a number of questions that we, we wanna propose later, but we welcome you and your staff and thank you for making the time for us. And uh, we'd like to open it up to you for your presentation. Uh, and, you know, we'll go from there. As you said, I won't, I won't, I won't let you uh, ramble on too much. So. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> appreciate your presence. And, and uh, Ron Young, thank you. Uh, Gabriel Ting, thank you. Glad you're here. Welcome, and we're ready to hear from you. All right, great, Paul. <clears throat> and excuse me, thank you. You know, to you, Paul, and and the discussion we had earlier today, and to all of the members from the community safety working group for having us on tonight and, and making time for us. I, I truly appreciate that. I would just like to say, you know, this discussion that Paul and I had earlier about the Chauvin Floyd murder trial verdict. Um, you know, I can't imagine or understand completely what it would feel like as a person of color to have to go through that. I can tell you as police officers, we were traumatized probably in a different way, but I think, you know, recognize that the verdict of guilty was what we had all hoped for as well. And the right verdict as well. Um, it's the beginning. I certainly recognize that. And there's a lot of work left to do and continued conversation about how do we improve policing, not only just not across the country, but in our community of Amherst. So uh, we're hopeful that this, you know, gets us moving in the right direction as far as having these conversations and making things better uh, across the country and specifically in, in the town of Amherst. So I certainly echo what a lot of the members already said, probably from a different perspective, but certainly feeling the same way that we were very, very hopeful for the guilty verdict and, and really respect that decision. So thanks for that. Um, you know, I did promise Paul that we, I would not ramble tonight because I know you guys are on a time schedule. So I'm gonna try and, um, you know, have comments and, and a little bit of overview about the very specific first paragraph uh, in an opening presentation. And then Captain Young and Captain Ting can maybe touch on some of the questions or topics in the second paragraph that was presented to us, you know, earlier in the week. So, um, you know, I'm gonna try and follow the agenda, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, looking back at where we are now as a police department and as an agency, I've been a police officer here in the town of Amherst since 1978, believe it or not. I know member in, yeah, I said 1978. Um, I know member, members of the committee here probably were not even born yet. So 
I've seen a lot and I've seen a lot of changes, some good, some have not been so good, but you know, the evolution of policing has, has changed a lot since I became a police officer. And, you know, we're transitioning into things that society really hasn't been able to figure out and, and solve. And what I mean by that is, you know, the types of calls that we're responding to are very, very different than the types of calls I responded to as a young police officer. You know, issues of, <clears throat> excuse me, homelessness and unemployment issues that the people call the police for, issues with mental health and people in crisis. You know, those were never issues that we previously responded to. Landlord tenant issues, you know, substance abuse, substance abuse issues with drug and alcohol programs or problems that are extended. Um, you know, 911 and, and the communications lines that we have really have kind of become the catch all for people to call in times of need. And, you know, we respond at, in the best of our abilities, but we've certainly had to adapt uh, as, as those requests have become more uh, on the agency. Um, you know, and I, I told Paul this and he thought it was kind of weird to hear this, but I told him a while ago that if, if we never had to respond to another mental health call in our careers, we would probably all be, you know, dancing in the streets because it, it's, it's burdensome and it's, it's difficult calls to respond to many, many times. But, you know, we, you know, with that being said, we've done our best to adapt and to train our officers um, and having to respond to those types of calls. You know, we've created crisis intervention teams. Officers have very specific training and roles and how to respond to those and do follow-up when um, people are in crisis. And that's not something I would have ever believed we would have done as an agency. You know, we have very specific officers who are trained um, for drug and alcohol response and follow-up in, in that uh, venue as well. You know, we have liaisons that are specific to the Craig's Door Shelter, who we work very, very closely with. So, you know, those are some of the things that we've been doing as an agency to try and adapt and do a better job. Uh, I happen to think we do a really good job. We are certainly not perfect and we continue to evolve when it comes to responses of that nature. Um, you know, I know there was some questions and um, wanted me to discuss basically, you know, about our BIPOC citizen community members, um, you know, how to better uh, respond to their needs. And I think the important thing that I'm going to need to know and our agency is going to need to know is what is it that makes the people feeling unsafe and not feeling safe that they can call us with issues and or concerns. So, I mean, the communication part and the outreach is going to be important to us moving forward um, so that we can understand, um, you know, why it is that they are afraid to call us or don't feel comfortable reaching out to us because I don't always know the answers and the reasons for that. Um, I know that we have scheduled future listening sessions um, post COVID and you know, those are gonna be organized from our facilitators from our recent racial justice and anti-racism training. So we look forward to being able to have those conversations and see how we can be a better police officer to respond to those types of concerns that they have because you know I, I don't recognize and I don't always know what it is that those citizens and those members of our community need from us. Um, so those listening sessions are going to be very, very important to us as, as officers and as agencies. You know, we're also looking at expanding and, and um, reintroducing our Citizens Police Academy. We used to run Citizen Police Academies for many, many years and the interest in those kind of waned. So we're going to bring those back as well post COVID and um, you know, tailor, the, tailor those academies that are specific to what people wanna hear and they wanna understand about why we respond to calls the way we do and what we do as police officers so that there's better understanding and potentially where we need to change as responders to those types of calls. So those are other things that we're looking at um, to reach out to our BIPOC citizens and community members. You know, we, we started a ambassadors program um, several months ago. 
Um, it, it's been extremely successful. The COVID ambassadors response roles were just that. They were very specific to dealing with issues of COVID and, um, and just educational type thing, but it's been so popular and so successful that we're looking at methods to expand you know, their roles in responding to calls. So it may, what other types of things can they be engaged in? And I was speaking with the town manager, you know, would it be possible to have unarmed civilian people responding to things like noise complaints and that sort of thing? So, you know, we're really having those types of conversations about what else can they do? You know, can they be facilitators for a response to mental health? And I know you have a draft that's going to be voted on if not tonight soon about the press responders. And I see this as a, a team effort. Um, you know, whatever comes of your recommendations to the town manager for civilian responders, you know, we as an agency want that to be successful. Um, and we will assist and facilitate that as best we can with whatever requests are made of our agency. So. You know, we look forward to those conversations and the potential of what that may bring as an agency. I'm very familiar with the, you know, with some of the other uh, roles that are being brought about in other parts of the country, uh, whether we're talking about the STARS program or, or Eugene, Oregon. You know, I've spoken to the police officers that have been uh, charged with overseeing some of those um, response response teams as well. And they've talked about nothing but positive things about that. So, you know, we're looking forward to having those conversations as well. Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of stop there. I don't want to keep going on, Paul. I, I know you were going to hold me to a very specific timeline, but I'll, I'm more than happy to be willing to turn this over to Ron and Gabe so that they can talk about, you know, the questions and topics that the other members of the community safety working group had as well. But also, I'm more than happy to entertain questions with anything that I presented or, or said tonight. So, Paul, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief Livingstone, and, and thank you all for being here. Just so you, you the, the, the three of that you and, and your other uh, staff members who are here, uh, the uh, Community Safety Working Group had worked on some questions that we have for you. Um, uh, that, you know, pre-presentation that we want to talk to you about. And um, we, we were going to, we're going to forward those initially when you're done. Mm -hmm. I do want to respect the time that both uh, Captain Young and Captain Ting, I can't believe Ting's a captain already. But anyway, I've known him for so long I can mess with him. But anyway, that they're here and I want to honor their time and what you expect them to present to us that might be inform our work. And then I want to give uh, full attention to the questions that our, our community safety working group has, has come forward. So with your, your permission, I'd like for you to just acknowledge and recognize either uh, Captain Young or, or Captain Ting to go forward with this. I'd like to, since they're here, hear from both of them and then we'll, we'll dive into our questions if that's okay. Sure, um, and again, we were just kind of follow your agenda. So the bullet items that you had specific to protocols and practices about community outreach and, and traffic stops and search and more, those types of things. And Captain Ting would be more than happy to talk about those. And Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Captain Ting, welcome. Thank you for having me, everybody. Uh, good evening, first of all. And, um, you know, and taking a look at the agenda, uh, one question here was uh, that was asked was to describe the challenges currently facing the Amherst Police Department as it seeks to serve the Amherst community. So um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of some of those challenges that that our agency faces on a daily basis. And some of these challenges are are ongoing challenges. And some of these challenges, I think, will always be here because of the nature of our town and community. And um, some of them, hopefully we will have a resolution to. Um, so first and foremost, I just wanna mention the challenge that we have uh, in our department is maintaining our accreditation process. You know, we are an accredited agency and we have been since 2003. 
And for those of you who don't quite understand or know what accreditation is, what that is, is um, it's a three-year assessment from, uh, from the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission. So it's a state uh, governed agency. They review our policies and procedures and our rules and regulations. Essentially, it's a process to professionalize and standardize um, best practices in policing. And that's something that, uh, that we are very proud of. Um, we try to hold our agency at the highest standard. So that's something that we are consistently working on. Um, again, we are assessed every three years. So that's something that is, um, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, certainly this past year, one of our largest challenges was uh, dealing with COVID-19 issues. Um, we've had to create a lot of different protocols to keep everyone safe and healthy as well as our agency so we can help our community. Um, one thing that's a constant is quality of life issues. You know, this being a college town, um, that's a constant, you know, from noise complaints to large parties to public drunkenness, OUIs and uh, disturbances. That's something that's a regular occurrence due to us being a college town. Um, we've worked really hard. You know, the chief had touched upon, you know, the evolution of our police department. You know, something like quality of life issues. We used to, uh, Kind of use arrest as our as our main form of education and we've learned over the years that that's probably not the best way to go and that's kind of kind of how we view a lot of our issues you know we used to arrest our way out of it that's kind of the terminology that we utilize and we learned that there's other ways of doing that uh, so we've partnered with uh, the university to try and create other positions we have a neighborhood liaison officer a community outreach officer to try and educate versus going through punitive measures. And that's been highly successful. Um, that's just one snippet of some of the evolution changes that we've been going through in our police department. Another uh, staple is homelessness. You know, we've partnered up with Craig's Doors. We do have officers who are liaisons to uh, our homeless population. And we also coordinate with the bid and local businesses that might be affected to try and mitigate some of the homelessness issues. Um, so that's something that's been uh, at the forefront. And coupled with that, certainly we've already discussed that a little bit is dealing with uh, the uptick in mental health related issues. Um, it seems like, you know, in the past, the chief had mentioned that, you know, we never really went to calls like that. Although the problems were probably there, it's just that it's a lot more recognized these days. Um, so we've been trying to find better ways of trying to handling those calls to try and minimize uh, physical contact and minimize use of force. Um, so coupled with that comes with a lot of training and a lot of recognition of, of de-escalation processes and whatnot to try and make sure that we come up with a better product. Uh, another challenge that we have is um, making sure that all of our schools and our public buildings and private entities and religious congregations are all trained up for active shooter training. So we have a process called ALICE. And what that is, is um, it's a system to try and coordinate with the police department as well as our dispatch center and our fire departments in the event of an active shooter situation. So um, that's something that's an ongoing challenge to try and get everybody trained up on that. Um, a couple other things. Uh, uh, certainly traffic enforcement is a huge issue in our town. Um, the chief didn't allude to it, but that's probably one of the largest complaints that he gets is for traffic issues. And that could be from our main roads, Bay Road, North Pleasant Street, or specific neighborhoods. You know, one neighborhood that we've been dealing with a lot for traffic issues is Grantwood Drive, uh, Elf, Hill, Elf Hill Road, and that association. Uh, certainly, like I said, Bay Road and Amity Street are big ones as well as Amherst Woods. A um, couple other challenges I'd like to mention is certainly recruiting. Uh, it seems like nationwide, it's been really difficult to find quality candidates. It just it seems like nobody really wants uh, to have any interest in this profession as much anymore. So that's really a challenge. Um, it's also a challenge to, to basically in, enhance our agency to be a lot more attractive to the BIPOC community. That's something that's at the forefront and it has been for a long time. Um, coupled with that is our retention of officers. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of uh, competition out there, certainly nowadays in this field. Uh, if you want to become a police officer, there's a lot of opportunities out there. You know, we just can't, we have a hard time hanging on to them. And we have a hard time recruiting for them. So those are some of the issues that, or challenges that, that our agency is facing on a daily basis. Um, so that's just a quick overview. Uh, and the biggest uh, challenge I think we have is, you know, something that I learned from one of our past meetings. You know, when, in our past meeting, somebody had mentioned that, that a lot of times community members find it difficult to be able to communicate with the police department. And that's something I, I don't understand because I am part of the police department. So my question is, you know, if that's the case if, and if there are barriers, I wanna figure out what those barriers are. I wanna try and open up those lines of communication and give everyone the opportunity to come and ask us questions and to collaborate and try and figure out, you know, what those problems are and what solutions we can find for them. That's why I truly appreciate, you know, being invited into this process. Thanks, Gabe. Thank you. Uh, if if you if you see our our heads down, uh, folks, we're 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 not ignoring you. We're writing furiously at this point. Uh, thank you, Chief Livingstone. Thank you, uh, uh, Captain Ting. Uh, Captain Young, you are here as well, and I would I would defer to uh, Ms. Uh, Cap uh, to Chief Livingstone introduce you to see the, what your offering might be for this, e this evening's meeting. Yes, yeah, so specifically Captain Young, part of what he's responsible for as an administrative captain is all of the training that goes out inside this agency and it's pretty extensive. So he can talk about briefly how an officer gets trained as to be a police officer and what follows up with that. And, but he's also a very, very important role. He oversees a lot of our grants and is the facilitator for our crisis intervention team members. Those are the guys and gals that specifically respond to crises for those individuals who need it. And he also sees our, you know, drug and alcohol response team members, our liaisons to the, to the Craig's Door shelter, pretty much everything, you know, goes through Ron when it comes to next steps and trainings and being responsible and overseeing, you know, those types of things responsible for all of the requests that he gets for um, records requests. And there, there's a lot of them right now, Ron. Well, he used to have hair, um, but he's been pulling it out lately. So um, in any case, Ron, I'll turn it over to you now to speak a little bit about you know, your responsibilities. I he's appreciate that, Chief. Out, well, he's been pulling it out more than lately. I've known him for a while. <laughs> you, Mr. Wiley, I haven't had hair for 30 years. <laughs> Tell me. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for, you know, helping us understand th this whole context and uh, we appreciate all of you being here. Please, please present. I thank you, sir. And, and is it, just to echo what Gabe said, I th thanks for the group. Um, I know that your time is precious and, and having us here is, uh, is important. And um, it's, it's kind of humbling a little bit to be, to be very honest. So um, I, I'll, I'll be very brief and then, you know, Perhaps you can answer follow-up. I can answer follow-up questions. Um, in terms of training, um, as the chief alluded to, there's a process when we hire a new police officer. Um, I think everyone's familiar with the you know the academy process. Here in Massachusetts, that takes 26 weeks, so it's about half a year um, before somebody can actually get out of training. Um, we also have a 14-week field training program. So once so once we've hired somebody, once they've been vetted, they've gone through the hiring process, a background investigation is completed, a psychological um, process has been completed, then they go to the academy and then subsequently they have a field training process. We really don't get somebody out on the street for about a year. It takes about a year from beginning to end. Um, our, but that's not really where the training ends. And quite honestly, I think that's really where it begins. You know, the, the MPTC mandates specific trainings that we have to do on an annual basis that amounts to somewhere between 36 to 48 hours, depending on the fiscal year. And they do run on the fiscal year. Um, we augment our training here based on departmental needs. So, you know, there are certain skill sets that people need. Um, we try to rotate through and keep it fresh. Um, like, like this past year, um, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, people 
who have disabilities, elder abuse types, things like that. We try to rotate it through so that the people actually out on the street have some working knowledge about how to better serve the community. Um, training, training is tough um, sometimes simply because we have to make certain that, that we, we adhere to what the MBTC requires of us. And that's, as you would know, that that's, that is a state mandate. Um, and it, it can be challenging sometimes because we do a lot of our training in-house, but we have to farm it out to people who have a better skill set or a more deserving skill set to bring to our agency. So this kind of training in a nutshell, um, I, I, I certainly would answer or entertain any questions about it more in depth. And just to kind of parallel onto that, the chief alluded to the fact that I, I oversee CIT and DART. Um, so CIT really, I've been a cop a long time, not quite as long as the chief, but, but a very, very long time. I'm, I'm in my fourth decade of being a cop. It's probably the biggest paradigm change in our, in our agency since I've been here. Um, Gabe had alluded to it earlier. It was the old cliche. We go to you know, the vast majority of people who suffer from behavioral health issues or more specifically uh, substance abuse type issues, we would respond and we'd arrest our way out of it. You know, a lot of those calls come from, or the genesis of them are underlying criminal acts. They may be minor in nature, disorderly conduct, disturbances, things of that nature. And when we got there as a young cop, I really was wholly unprepared on how to deal with that. Uh, my training was limited. Um, I had no training at all. I'm not a clinician. Um, and I just knew I had to solve the problem. And quite frequently, we'd investigate minor crimes and make arrests for very minor crimes. The CIT program is the antith antithesis of that. It, it is more appropriately, it's a jail diversion program. We train a small number of police officers to respond to those calls. And we train the entire department to recognize the symptoms from when we would need a CIT officer to respond. The idea behind it is that it's a resource driven program. We don't want to arrest people. We actually arrest a very, very tiny number of people who suffer from behavioral health issues and drug abuse issues these days. Sometimes we can't help it. You know, the crime is so overwhelming that, it, that an arrest is deserving, but it happens very infrequently. We try to outsource that. We call our, we call our clinicians, we call our our, our people, our crisis response people to come, or if need be, we bring them there. Um, that's that is that's the whole substance of the CIT program, and it's, it's what we try to accomplish. DART kind of falls a similar pr programming, uh, while very infrequently that's actually a crisis situation, unless it's an overdose or a medical type problem. We we farm those out pretty quickly, and we 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 work through a variety of different uh, programs, most notably Hampshire Hope in Northampton, based in Northampton. Where we, where we hook people up with resources. Um, we ho hook people up with recovery coaches, things of that nature. We do do follow-up sometimes, um, but it's more wellness type follow-up. Um, we've, you know, as we know, the state has decriminalized a large portion of the narcotics laws anyways. Um, and those that haven't been decriminalized, unless it's really, really a flagrant violation, we, we tend to not bring those to court any longer if we can outsource it to somebody who can follow up at the medical end. So that's kind of CIT and DART and training in a very, very short window. Um, I'm, as, as I said, Mr. Wiley, I'm happy to answer any questions if the group has them. So, uh, so Mr. S Mr. Young, thank you. Um, CIT means? A crisis intervention team. So in JDP, when I say, I'm sorry if I speak quickly, JDP is jail diversion program. Just want to just want to be clear and make sure we're all on the same page. We have an understanding about some of the acronyms that come forward. And DART, DART is a drug resistance team. So, so drug drug recovery team. I'm sorry. So people who are sub, suffering from substance abuse disorders, most notably people who've OD'd. Um, we we have we have various resource avenues that we can provide for those folks. Thank thank you, sir. I, I appreciate the. Uh, presence of all of you here this evening uh, on behalf of, of our group. And uh, a, as you know, we, we have some questions for you and some of them, you know, there, there may be some additional questions I want to say ahead of time that may be sitting with people right now based on what you just reported. Mm -hmm. So they, they're, they're not pre known questions, if you will, but I, I'd like to take a moment uh, to 
just go through um, some of the questions we had ahead of time to see if we can give some very, you know, hopefully succinct answers. And if these any of these responses need more time, or maybe we need another conversation um, beyond this meeting, we'd happily de defer to that. But just so you, you hear from our community as a community safety working group, and hopefully it reflects some of the input that we're getting from our, our community through our uh, seven generations movement collective where some of these questions are coming from them as well, which I'm going to present. So um, I, I'd like to devote some time to this and, and uh, I would say maybe we'll put a cap on it at seven o'clock if that's okay and see how we go. We can check in with everybody at that time. But uh, again, thank you all for being here. And uh, let me just dive right in. One of the questions that came from uh, our, uh, our consultant group is, is, what is the number of people? And again, some of these may be very discreet. So if they are, if there's something you can answer, fine. If there's something you can't, we'd love to get the response from you as quickly as possible after your research. But what is the number of people booked into jail who have a suspected mental illness slash addiction issue? What is the average length of stay when booked? Ronnie, you wanna take a stab at that? Certainly chief. So I don't have a number for you, Mr. Wiley. Um, okay. the, you know, the, the I, I can tell you it's, it's, it's a very small number. Um, I, I could certainly I could certainly probably mine some of that out of our out of our our system. Regardless, the one part of that that I can answer definitively is very few people stay in our custody for very for very long. Um, we whether they're either bailed or more likely than not, if it's discovered that there is some type of underlying issue, whether it's behavioral health, mental health, drug disorder. Um, we, we will want to get them where they need to be. They don't need to be in a cell. They need to be in the emergency room. They don't need to be at the cell. They need to be with CSO or at, at the living space down at BHN or something along those lines. I will tell you that a vast majority of people that we discover who have behavioral health issues, it comes in with an underlying crime first. So we don't just encounter people. We actually receive a very few calls that come in as a, as, as a medical problem. More often it comes in as some type of disorder and there are as frequently, if it's not recognized right away, those people may be arrested, but we try to divert them and we can divert them and they do in fact do divert them out of practice after we discover that that's the underlying root cause. So there are, very, there are varying ways to handle that. Um, it's a very complex answer. I can try and help mine that, but I, I don't have, a, I can't tell you if it's three, three a week or, or three a year, um, I'm, I can tell you it's not three a week, but it's 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 a very tiny number of people. And I understand, and I'm speaking, you know, to you directly, but please understand also this is coming from these questions are coming from a different from different folks on our on our 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 community safety working group. Sure, get it. You know, all these things aren't aren't answerable, but if there's is some data mining you can do on that that might be informative to us. We'd appreciate a response to that. So, so one of the things that I'm required to do on a monthly basis is I have to report to the Dep Department of Mental Health, the people whom that right. we that we divert. Um, so that's one number that I could, I could provide pretty readily. Um, as you discussed earlier, there would have to be some discretion, of course, because yeah. we're, we're talking about people's medical backgrounds. But if we're talking strictly numbers, that's a number that I could find pretty readily. Thank you. And I'm going to I'm going to work through this in, in sort of linear fashion here. But this is our first bucket. This was on protocols and practices. And the second question that came from this, this is a combination of my question as well as our consultant group that's working with us because they're not on our community. But I wanted to to funnel this question to you on their behalf, uh, as was the first one. What what is the percentage of people with suspected mental health slash addiction? issues who are then connected to treatment. And I, I'm gonna I'm throw something in there, rather than, you know, arrested, put in jail, 
you know, retained, detained, how quickly does that turn around to a treatment? Uh, Pretty quickly. So more often than not, it comes right from the street. Um, you know, there, there are a large number of people that we offer services to that don't want them. And that's, you know, that's fine. But there, I, I can't give you a percentage. We could try and figure that out. But the, I can tell you the vast majority of people that present in that fashion um, are somehow wired in. And sometimes it might be at the very lowest level. Sometimes, we, as I said, we might actually have to transport them to a place where they can receive services immediately. Um, we have, been, we have I, I, I heard the term recidivism in there. We, there are several people that we've brought numbers of times and they come back and we bring them again and they come back and we bring them again. It is, it's just a different mindset. You know, culturally, it's a completely different animal than it was even five years ago. Thank you, uh, Captain Young. And, and by the way, the, 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 the background context for this is we have a particular interest as a community safety working group to be conscious of the impact that uh, this is having on um, BIPOC community people. Uh, yeah. So as you're, you're thinking about this and responding to this, any information that can be filtered through that lens as well would be important to us because that um, we're, we're finding is a community that is, is disproportionately impacted by the interaction with police and that, uh, you know, uh, systemically the way it is structured, that's what happens. So as you, as you're collecting this data, you know, that's a, that's an additional filter. Uh, I'd like for you to commit, um, uh, think about as well, if you would. Um, also, I'm just I'm going to go right through these questions because these are questions that people raised and they came they came to uh, to me beforehand. Does the a, uh, APD track keep track of, of rearrest recidivism rates for persons suspected of confirmed or, or I'm sorry suspected or confirmed to have mental health addiction issues? So, so we do track all those numbers. Um, you know, I, I think that we, I think if there was something that jumped out that we would utilize that as a way to try and force, enforce the, perhaps force the issue as opposed to somebody who, um, who didn't want treatment readily. So we've had a very few number of people, usually people that not only have, they have a, you know, they have a coexisting mental health issue as well as a substance abuse issue. Uh -huh. we've, we've sought relief through the courts for that. Um, more often than not, we'll work with the family members because quite frequently that's, that's how, how we, we end up quite, you know, honestly. So, but that number's tiny. Um, we, we do get some recidivism, but it's, it's usually not criminal conduct. It's, it's more, it's more just trying to reacquaint them or get them wired back in with a service that might help them get somewhere where they want to be. Um, so the data is there, it's captured. Um, it's, it's not, it's not really anything that's really driven the program, so to speak, simply because we try to deal with each individual case on a case by case basis. Thank you. Um, for those in, in, on the group, I want to remind folks in the group and as well as people who may be uh, in the public and, uh, listening to this, um, in addition to our consulting group, we have had, uh, written communications with the police department prior to this conversation. And it's been a, uh, an email exchange of questions and answers and responses. So the police department has responded to a number of questions that we've had, uh, admittedly, and Chief Livingstone knows this too, there, there were, were gaps in those responses. So we went back a second time and there, were, uh, there was a second response as well as some narrative response from the chief around this. And um, so we do have lots of information that we've received. Uh, context change, uh, situations change, circumstances change. And uh, so this, this conversation also hopefully rolls into a more contemporary context of what's going on with the police as we approach uh, budget time. 
and what we have to do relative to proposals that we have to present to the town manager who in turn will present these to the town. So just some background information for people listening in, this is not a first conversation with the police department. Uh, and you know we're we're continuing to deepen and and dive in deeply with the with this conversation. So this is what this is about. I I want to just go through real quickly. Um, I just Miss well, Bowman has her hand up and it's been up for a while. I don't know if you would like to address that. I would not. like to continue with the questions that I received beforehand, and then I'll come. I want to get through these because I want to honor the questions that people submitted. I will make time for the folks who are having it, their hands up right now. No, but I, I, can I ask my question though? Because the, the next question is my question. Can oh. I ask? Well, you're, you're tired of hearing my voice, huh, Miss Miss Ferreira? So, <laughs> I just think I think so we, need I, get, we need to get other voices. Like I want to hear Miss Bowman. I was trying I wanna, to do that, but I, I think it's good to have other voices also. Yeah, I don't have the names at this point. The, the different voices. So I, go right ahead. Feel free. Go ahead, Miss. Oh. And then I'll. Oh, well, wait. So I don't know, Ms. Bowman is Ms. trying Bowman to say something. Ms. Bowman will go first and then Ms. Ferreira. Okay, go ahead. All right, so basically I'm just gonna be forthright and very honest right now. This whole part of the meeting has me extremely triggered. Um, and I just need to put that out there because I, there's, it's just so complex why I'm tr triggered right now. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, um, get into details about it because I know we have so much to get through, but I need you all to know that I am extremely triggered by this part of the meeting. I am extremely unhappy about this part of the meeting. So that's all I'm gonna say right now, but you, I need to make that statement. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, thank you, Ms. Ferreira. All right, so yeah, so the next question, I was the one that had um, put in the question, but I guess before I asked that question, I did wanna kind of make a comment in terms of some of the things that uh, Chief Livingstone, as well as I think uh, Captain Ting had kind of said, which was something like, you know, we wanna, and I don't obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but like, why do BIPOC people, sometimes you, you're not understanding why you're not totally being able to be responsive to, you know, what BIPOC people need and everything. And I just want to kind of bring up two examples in terms of that. When you asked those questions, uh, you know, as a BIPOC person myself, I want to say that, you know, one is that I remember being at a function where it was majority people of color and, um, and there was a noise complaint, right? And then two police officers showed up. And this was people of color, you know, all, you know, 40s in their 40s and things like that. And, you know, and we were trying to explain, okay, this, you know, we're having a party, this and that and the other. And instead of the police officers, you know, just engaging with us, it became, uh, you all better shut it down. If you don't, you're going to get arrested. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, and I was there, you know, I, you know, I, I came up, I was like, I'm an attorney. I'm just, it doesn't matter who you are you know, it was that type of communication, right? So so when it's that type of communication without any type of, of, of conversation, that's why, um, you know, BIPOC community don't want to reach out to you all. They don't want, and they're afraid, right? That's what it causes, elicits fear in us. And then another one was more, even more recently where I got a community member who contacted me who said that I guess in town, in, a, in Amherst town, there was this, this BIPOC family, so, I, you know, black family that was stopped by the police in the middle of town. And there was not only just one police officer vehicle, there was several police officer vehicle, right? That had stopped them in the middle of town. Then there was little kids there too, because they had kids. Then the kids were there and everything. And so everyone was looking around. So this community member contacted me because they were like, that looked just crazy. That looked just inappropriate and not okay. You know, to have a police, a, 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 a family, of color be stopped in that way, not just one vehicle, but several vehicles so that they look like they were some type of, you know, terrorists or criminals, or I don't know what it was, but it, it just, again, not a way to communicate with BIPOC people. And that's why BIPOC people are very afraid to communicate with you all and don't trust the police and don't trust that you're gonna take care of what it is that we need you to take care of, right? So I just wanna put those two things out there. Now, in, in terms of my question, um, 
because as, as Mr. Wiley had said, as Paul had said, we had asked several times in terms of the data, you know, like really get into the nitty gritty. I want some examples, right? So how, um, so please give an actual example of how APD would respond to a call involving someone who has a mental health, a houselessness, homelessness, or substance abuse problem. But an actual example. So what would you do? Some you get called, you know, you get a call dealing with any of these issues. What would you actually do? So sure, and thanks, thanks for those comments, Ms. Fiera. So as Captain Young pointed out, the way call these calls typically come in, it doesn't come in as a, hey, there's a mental health problem going on at this location or that location. There's usually something else that triggers it. It could be something as simple as a shoplifting call or a disturbance or a fight or something of that nature. And when the initial officers are dispatched and respond um, and they start to recognize, okay, there's something else going on here. That's when they would call in a member of the crisis intervention team who would deal with those issues specifically um, so that they have a, the additional training, the recognition and the resources to get these people, these individuals, the help they need. So, you know, it it, it doesn't initially always come in at, at, in the, when officers are responding that they know what they're getting into as far as a mental health crisis call. As a matter of fact, it's very rare that they would go and know ahead of time that it's that type of a call. You know, some of them are very specific. Somebody may call and say, you know, I've been talking to my friend and they're out of state and this is individuals not doing so well you know those are easy to understand and respond to but the majority of those types of calls when we initially get dispatched to them we don't have that type of information that, that that's what we're responding to um, we've come to learn because there are some individuals that we deal with multiple times so if there are names associated with it we definitely know what we're getting into or who are we dealing with so, and again, those are easier ones to get officers to respond to who have that specific training, but it's not very frequent that we do know that. I hope that answered your question. Um, kind of, but if you can uh, provide like more detail in terms of like, once you do know it's the, yep. a mental health, what and, do you do Cap then? Yeah, I think Captain Young can jump on there. I'll give you kind of, and I'm going to, Ms. Ferreira, I'm going to kind of talk in general terms because it's about a real case that happened a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, for, for, for obvious, for privacy reasons, right? But so there was a call that came in for somebody who was loitering around the back of a building here in the center of town. One of the officers gets over there. He's an experienced officer. He's not a CIT cop. He's an old guy like me, to be honest with you. So he sees what's going on there. And because he's had mental health first aid training, he recognizes this isn't a trespassing situation. It's not a disorderly conduct problem. It's a CIT problem. It's, it's somebody, he's not a clinician. He calls another officer that comes to the scene who has CIT training and more importantly, has some, has some very real experience dealing with people like at, at BHN or over at CDH. The guy recognizes the cop because they've dealt with one another before. They have a dialogue. Um, he goes on and on and on. He's clearly in crisis. Um, he's disheveled. He's dirty. I'm going to tell you, when I was a young cop, that guy probably would have been arrested. It, it, I'm being real, right? I'm being honest. Knowing who I was when I was a 25-year-old cop. They ended up, it took a long time. Our policy dictates that the shift commander has to give them enough time to solve the problem. They ended up getting in touch with somebody in Florence at CSO. Um, clinical support options. They had a spot for him. He didn't feel comfortable getting into a police car. He didn't want to get into a, into a police car. We didn't have a civilian person to do that. So we ended up getting an unmarked car, putting him in there, bring him over to Florence. Um, he ended up being admitted at a later time because he, once he was with a clinician, um, they were able to get him wired back in with his team. And he'd had, he'd had some other medical issues in the past as, as, as the kind of the story equates to. But I guess my point being is from a philosophical standpoint, that probably would have resulted in an arrest even 10 years ago. He, again, he didn't belong in jail. He needed to be at the hospital. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's my goal. And that's the goal. And if a good JDP program, um, 
takes off. That's what it has to be based on. I'm kind of echo, I'm going to echo what I'm going to Mr. Wiley was talking about earlier. If you're familiar with the CIT program at all, it comes from like anything that's decent. It comes from tragedies. It came from a shooting of a person, a person of color, by the way, in Memphis a number of years ago, who was suffering from behavioral health issues. So the CIT model that we use here in Massachusetts is loosely based on, is sometimes referred to as the Memphis model. So that's typically, that. that's in my perfect world, that call went the way it's supposed to go. And a call that probably would have taken 15 minutes when I was a young cop and locked up somebody who didn't need to be locked up, took an hour and a half. Time well invested, right? To me. Thank uh, you. Ms. Walker, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, I have a couple of different questions. Um, one, I know um, one of the officers spoke about the um, standardized policies coming from the state in terms of, and so I'm wondering if they govern the training processes, like if they decide which trainings you guys administer and implement, or if you guys yourselves have discretion as to which trainings you will implement or require. And then that also leads me to wonder, because you did state that when hiring a new police officer, you guys have um, a background check, a psychological assessment. And um, in terms of like making bends with the BIPOC community or looking towards um, trying to smoothen the communication that happens there, have you guys ever considered implementing a racial bias assessment before hiring new officers? Um, or have any of these things ever been considered or what other things have you guys considered as a police department to make amends with the BIPOC community is my first question. And then my second question is, in terms of the CIT training, what does that entail and how long is the training? Chief, you want me to handle? Yeah, go ahead. Do you want me to, I'll take the CIT end of it, sir. So the CIT, so mental health first aid and CIT is required by 100%. It's a 40 hour training. Um, and it's, it's not done by police officers. It's handled by clinicians um, that, are, that are outlined in, in, and are trained up as part of DMH. So we get our training from the Department of Mental Health. Um, it's a 40 hour training. Sorry, Chief. That's fine. And, and then I'll talk about the annual training that's mandated by the state. So, you know, after a police officer becomes a police officer and they receive the initial training, um, there's a committee that's uh, a state committee that I happen to actually sit on and represent the Western Mass region. And I've been on that committee for 11 years now. It's called the Municipal Police Training Committee. It's going through a lot of changes right now based on the Police Reform Act that was just recently passed by the governor and by our legislators. But what that committee decides annually is what trainings all police officers in the state have to go through. And, you know, that's called, it's called the annual training. And it changes from year to year. We try and find topics that are, A, the legislators sometimes make recommendations. So, our legislator, you know, being either Joe Comerford or Mindy Dome, would reach out to us and say, hey, you know, citizens are interested in officers getting training in this. So they'll make recommendations. Other recommendations come from police officers or police chiefs and say, we need additional training in, in this, you know, specialty so, and that sort of thing. And those, those mandated annual trainings, um, it's typically mandated at 40 hours, right? And so every police officer in the state has to get that. And it's very specific topics. And then our agency, we go above and beyond that. And we'll do additional trainings, as Captain Young and Captain Ting said, for officers who have interest in other things. You know, and it could be something as simple as an officer has expertise in crime scene. So, you know, if they go to a crime scene, they will fingerprint and photograph. Or as, as crisis intervention team members. Those are volunteers and officers who have interest in that. One of our officers, before was a police officer, was a social health specialist. So that was his interest and that's what he, he gravitated towards. Um, so that's kind of the annual uh, training that all officers get and that, that, that is continuous. So it, it takes the full year to get all of that training accomplished. And then you start over again with, with some different topics and that sort of thing. Was there something else we missed or something else you wanted to add? 
Yeah, sorry. So that was helpful. But the second piece of my question was, have you guys ever considered something like doing um, a racial bias assessment before hiring an officer? Or what other practices or policies have you guys implemented trying to make um, amends or smooth out communication with the BIPOC community? Gabe, you want to take a sing at that as far as the accreditation and hiring process? Uh, yeah, I just, I, I guess, uh, Ms. Walker, I just want to understand what you mean by um, a, a race assessment during the recruiting process. I'm not quite, I'm not quite following what you mean by that. Um, so I was just wondering, because you said you do a psychological assessment and what that entails and if it looks for racial biases within the officers that are applying to be um, working with the department. Yeah, I think that's a part of it, part of their psychological exam. We don't conduct that. You know, we farm that out to a specialist. To um, it's it's actually a psychiatrist that meets with uh, each candidate for several hours, and they have a battery of tests that that they go through. And at the completion of those tests, they get analyzed to make a determination if uh, if they're a good fit. You know, certainly mentally, and um, they do take that into consideration. Absolutely. I'm sorry, what, what was the other portion of your question? Um, and then if you, specifically for you guys, the Amherst Police Department, if there are any uh, policies or trainings or anything that you've done besides the anti-racist training, um, looking towards making amends with the BIPOC community or smoothing out communication with the BIPOC community. Um, yeah, you know, the thing is, is, is we are constantly seeking that type of training. Um, you know, annually, uh, we try and find uh, trainings that, that have to do with bias training. Um, a lot of times the training that we have found is, is kind of like, uh, we call it a box check. What I mean by that is that's something that's required. And we're always constantly looking for something a little bit more than that. Uh, just recently, we actually had a training with uh, Mr. Wiley and his group. Uh, and the reason why he was chosen was because, you know, we wanted something a little bit more meaningful, something that was going to be localized as well. And that was, that proved to be extremely, extremely, um, successful in my opinion. Uh, so that is that definitely at the forefront. I, I hope that answers your question, Ms. Walker. Ms. Bowman. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of opportunities for race training out there. Um, I know Harvard has a project implicit. Um, also, there's you rock, which is undoing undoing racism. I mean, there's a lot of things out there that could that the police department could do for themselves to exactly. really have an understanding. I'm also just going to point out, or actually ask the question: um, What kind of historical teaching do you guys do in order to understand what? what the reason, the original reason for police was and how that impacted BIPOC communities. Because the thing is, is like you guys are saying that you don't understand or you don't, you know, you don't know why BIPOC community is afraid of you. There's, there's this thing where everybody has cellular memory. And so, and we pass that down generation to generation. You can look it up. It's all scientists, scientific stuff, but when you have generational trauma and it's at the hands of people who are supposed to serve us and be, be of service to the community, but those pe same people who are supposed to be of service to the community are not only killing, but maiming and being part of groups like the KKK and lynching and so on and so forth to community members. like. Why wouldn't we be scared of you? I lived in this area for a long time. I know I've known officers in this area that I've had absolutely no problem with that I know that if I was actually being traumatized some way that I know, but I have specific officers that I will ask for if I ever had to deal with something. And I'll tell you right now, those officers are all people of color because, because of the fact that I, at the end of the day, I don't feel safe in this community. And I've never, there's never been anything that I've done to like get in trouble. So I would think that I might have like literally just driving by a 
a police officer's car causes me to have my heart blood heart my my blood pressure raise causes my hands to sweat and it doesn't even matter if if like I'm driving a good car everything like there's no reason to be pulled over yet and still even driving by officers at who are who are directing traffic for you know the electric company or cut you were dealing with wires cause this very visceral reaction so that's what you guys need to be looking into and that's what you guys need to understand because you guys aren't going to understand the BIPOC community until you understand the trauma the BIPOC community has gone for and that is a history lesson and that's not for the BIPOC community to teach you that is for you to learn and you, as, you guys as police officers to take initiative to make your business. So that's all I'm gonna say. Thanks. Thanks, Royce, you're absolutely right. Let me just, if I, if I may, Captain Ting, let me just go back to say where, I wanna reel back to where we were. The, 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 the plan going forward here was based on the fact that we, we had some questions that were submitted by our, our committee who were asked to submit questions, we have questions that were submitted and we were gonna give those to you as we have them. And then, you know, certainly because of your comments and as a result of your comments, we would have other questions coming from our, our committee like the ones you've just heard. But I, I also don't wanna just, you know, dismiss the opportunity to, for you to hear the questions we, you know, some people have posed already. I don't have the names of the people who actually pr proposed them at this particular point, but I, I want you to hear those questions. We certainly, as I acknowledged before, will have other questions to ask beyond the questions we, we posed ahead of time based on your responses. That's that's understood. And I, and I think, we, you know, I, I'd like for you to hear those right now. I'd like to give those to you. Uh, as you, you remember, you know, uh, Ms. Ferreira said, I know this next question because it's mine. So that's fine. That I, 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 she, she asked it and, and we've had other questions come up as a result of that. I think the residual questions coming out of this conversation, I'd like to defer till we get to these questions that people have thought about and wanted to respond, wanted a response from you for. But also I'm conscious of the time and the fact that it, it, it's 710. It's and we, we've had it, we, we, we're, we're supposed to be having a conversation in addition to your presentation, uh, which is, has, you know, has been helpful to us, but we may not get to that at this point and we're gonna end up deferring it. And we were, you know, I, I hate saying this in a, in a, in a very in a stickler way, but we're on a timeline to get some things done here. So I, you know, in terms of the, the, the committee itself, the, the working group itself, um, I'd be happy to go through the, these other questions to be, uh, to be sure we get them on the page and, and because people thought about them or either that or I'd like to suspend it at this point and, and summarize because we do have some information we have to discuss as an emotion that people spend a lot of time creating for a community responder thing. So um, I'm just trying to get us back on track. I, I understand that people have these things they wanna share. And this would certainly not be the last time we talked to the police department. Um, you know, uh, Chief Livingstone and I talked about that. If we can't get through all of this tonight, we can get through it to another night. But I, I don't want us to pass off the time that we need to also give information, put more information forward that we need to get to the town to advance our charge and, and commit to our charge. So um, we, we literally have 15 minutes based on our schedule. So I, I don't want to, uh, if, we, if we have other information for the police department, uh, at, at this point, I would like to say, let, let's defer that conversation to another point uh, in, in time thank them for their commitment and their, their presence here and uh, have all of you, uh, you know, Chief Livingstone, uh, Captains, you know, Young and, and Ting 
respond to what you've heard from, from us and, and give us some feedback on that. And we can present another time to go forward. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like we're, we're, we're way over uh, and has extended ourselves in a way that's going to undermine our, our, our purposes for getting toward our own charge. So that's what I'd like to do right now. And, um, you know, we, we as a group will have other opportunities to talk, but I want to thank you for being here. And uh, we'll be in touch and set up another time for you to continue this conversation because our community has more converse, our, our working group has more questions for you uh, going forward. So, so thank you for being here and uh, we're gonna move forward with our agenda. Thanks, that, that sounds great, Paul. And um, I appreciate you know, all, the, all the questions of the panel and, and of the group and also all the comments. Um, and I hope my statement about not understanding the BIPOC community was, was not taken the wrong way. And I didn't mean it derogatory. I meant it as we need to hear more of the comments that we heard so that we do have a better understanding about how we move forward. So Ms. Bowman's comments and Ms. Fierra's comments, you know, those are good. It's good for us to hear that stuff. So um, that, that's what I'll say. And I, again, thank the working group for having us on tonight and look, look forward to future meetings and future discussions and future answers to your questions. So thank you, Paul. I appreciate you all for being here. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, we look forward to hearing from you. And I'm going to say on this line, if you, uh, again, to our, our community safety working group, if you have questions that you want to pose, please submit them so that we, we know going forward what we're getting into and what kind of information we need to get from the police department or anyone else. Um, so thank you all for being here. And um, uh, you know we're gonna move on to our other agenda item. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. So much moisture. Are we clear now? Um, Officer or Captain Ting is still here, but the rest of us are here, and we can move on with our meeting. Thank you. Um, um, I, I would like to move forward. We we have uh, a couple of things I want to acknowledge. One that um, and uh, Miss Miss Pat alluded to this earlier in the meeting. And I wanna reiterate um, the appreciation of the Community Safety Working Group for the work that uh, uh, Ms. Pat and others did. I'm losing the names on those Ms. Pat right now on the, the budget information that came forward. But there are a number of documents that uh, need to be uh, read and discussed and I, and I think we have to move in some way in, in collaboration with our town manager to determine where, where the next steps might be relative to, to budget in our proposals. And so circling back to our proposal, um, we, we have an, uh, a motion before us from the, uh, the folks who work on, the, uh, on this Crest proposal and we were planning to bring this forward to folks. Uh, you've had an opportunity to read it. You've had an opportunity to review it. And as it is a motion to present it to the town manager, um, I, I don't know if Ms. Moisten you're able to bring that up if necessary, but um, like to, uh, as this is a motion, I'd like to bring its content forward as a motion and get it seconded and to see if there are any questions related to this motion. If not, then I, I think we ought to move forward uh, with this so we can move things forward with our, our town manager and our town council. Any 
and thank you, by the way, those who put together this this motion in the time, um, Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms. Ms. Owen, Ms. Pat, you had a question related to this. Are you are you asking for someone to second the motion? Or? I want to just put it up there, just if if Ms. Moisting, I was giving her a moment to see if she can find it. it it's in our packet. I know. I just don't know which screen it's going to pop yeah, off on. Just a second. I think the perfect purpose of it, it is a motion as as it as it exists. <laughs> I don't want to read through the entire motion, but as it exists, and if I can get someone to second it and to see if there are any questions about it, I think the the crafters of this motion were keeping close to the language. And um, can and you see that? Yes, I can. And I'm old, so I can see it. But it's uh, the, they were keeping very close to the language and intent um, of the group. And so, as this is a motion, before we have any other comments or questions about it, I I would like to entertain a, a second to this as a motion as it exists. I second it. Thank you, Miss Miss Pat. Are there any questions or comments relative to this motion before we take a vote on it? Ms. Ferrer. Yeah, I, have quite, I have questions about this. One, I want it to be explicit that this is a, is a separate program, not a program with, uh, within the, the, the uh, police department that they have their own building. It doesn't have anything that says that, as far as I can tell, unless it is and I missed it. If I am, obviously, point, point me to that part in the motion. But I want that stated, that this is the separate in terms of the crest. Um, and then, you know, uh, and then the other one too, I don't want it to just be, and I know that that's something that we have, we had talked in the press grid, uh, because obviously we were trying to get through the grid, um, because we weren't even able to get through the grid, grid for several weeks. But the other part too, that I'm not in total agreement with is Crest staff will be the first responders to cause rape, mental health issues, homelessness substance abuse, trespass, truancy, wellness checks, youth and schools. I want it to be more inclusive of just like all nonviolent incidents. You know, I want, I want disturbances. I want, you know, uh, noise complaints. I don't want the police responding to any of them. So I think that this is too, this is too exclusive. It's not inclusive enough. It needs to be more inclusive. I would even go so far as to say traffic violations. I wouldn't want them doing traffic either. But I know that obviously that might need more discussion. So I'm I'm good with being more inclusive, saying no all non all incidents that do not include that do not um, have any violence, all non-violent incidents. This does not go far enough for me. Oh, um, okay. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Ferreira. The 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 crafters of this uh, motion, and I know you were acting on behalf of the the community safety working group after reading it myself, a, uh, a lot, if not a majority of this information that, that I see in here is coming from our conversations and discussions. I, I, I want to hear from you if you'd like to comment, Mr. Vernon Jones and Ms. Ms. Owen, on your, um, in, in response to Ms. Ferreira, and then I'll go to Ms. Walker. Well, I, I can just say that we believe our charge was to write a motion that captured the things we had talked about last week. And we stuck very close to the language that everybody had agreed on. So we were only moving things that we felt everybody had already agreed on. Um, I have no disagreement with what Ms. Ferreira said. I mean, in the introduction, it said in nonviolent, non-criminal situations. Um, but if, if we want to add to the list now, uh, that's okay with me. Um, but in general, I think there may be any number of additions or further things we'd like to specify further. Um, but given the press of time, I guess I might have some preference to pass this and then make additions as we um, refine the program. And because there may be all kinds of things we'd like to add. 
Um, Ms. Owen, you worked on this as well. Is anything you want to add to that? Yeah, for me, so I just went over the notes from our last meeting and followed it really closely. I also don't have any objections to the comments made. I do think um, one thing that wasn't as specific, but I don't think we talked about it as much last week, was it being separate. I thought that we were all on board with it being in a separate place, separate cars, but I do think that we should go back and make sure we're specific in the motion so it's in writing. Mm -hmm. Ms. Walker? Um, I just wanted to speak in support of Ms. Ferreira um, and say that I agree with all of the things that she brought up. Um, I do understand and appreciate the work from Mr. Vernon Jones and Mrs. Owen, um, and they did follow pretty closely what we discussed. Um, but I think because this is our only motion, like we're not going to vote another motion for recommendations that we need to make sure we address all of the recommendations that we want to have in here. Um, because I know it's a little bit difficult. We didn't get to talk or or come to an agreement on everything, but there's not going to be another chance to. And so I think we need to be as specific as possible. Um, but I also agree with Mr. Vernon Jones that it could be a possibility just to eliminate the specificities completely and leave it as nonviolent, non-criminal situations and then specify later when we either do the budget recommendation or the full outline of what the program will be, what exact um, calls will go to the CREST program, um, because I do think it needs to be more inclusive. Um, and I think it would be helpful to go through the police budget. If you go to the, the budget that Mr. Bachelman sent us, um, the community safety budget, there is a breakdown of all calls received by police last year and what those types of calls were in order of the amount that they received of each call. And so I think it would be helpful for us to use that as a list, as a guide, because that specifies what kinds of calls we would want to go to the CREST program, um, but I think that can also be done at another time. And, and I'd like to make a comment to both uh, Ms. Owen and Mr. Vernon Jones uh, about, I, I think I, you know, I've read this and it is very, very close to the, um, the, the intent that, that has come forward from the group and the, the language and articulation of the motion is, is it is on point. I agree with Ms. Walker and, and Ms. Ferreira and others who may have some uh, particular deep dives we need to go into around particular things. But I think the, the whole idea behind the motion was to put something in place to, to move forward so that we could begin to move into other areas around budget, around, um, you know, sort of the more discrete uh, aspects of, of program development. But I, I think, I think you know, we will have, we, I, I see us having an opportunity to do that. But I, I also see that this is an opportunity for us to advance the, the, the motion. And um, because we have an obligation to the town, certainly in addition to our, our deeper discussions we need to have um, and our commitment to the um, uh, working with our uh, seven generations movement collective who are also bringing in information uh, for a report. So I, I, I think movement on this would be important for us to, to get through at this point with the, uh, with the agreement that we would go into further discussion on more discrete items. Ms. Ms. Moyston. Yeah, I, I do believe that if you guys can agree quickly on or know exactly what the terms are that you can do a motion with amendments. Correct, Paul? That's correct, we can. Yeah, so. I don't know which Paul you were asking, but yeah. I think that's true. Uh, I want to recognize hands, uh, Vernon, Mr. Vernon Jones and Ms. Ms. Pat. Let's, let's have Ms. Pat go first, please. So I want to thank uh, Ms. Sarah Vernon Jones and Ms. Brian Owen, uh, Brianna Owen for developing this. As a subcommittee that worked on the budget, and because we've been talking about CREST being an independent agency, department of its own, I, I thought people assumed that this is going to be in, independent of police. There is nothing in this, line, in this document that stays under the direction of the police. I'm okay with what Ms. Ferreira had suggested, but I think the sooner we, you know, uh, approve this, 
maybe we can do an amendment or add more, but time is of the essence, basically. But it's nothing here that says it has to be under the police. Mr. Vernon Jones, thank you, Ms. Pat. Mr. Vernon yeah. Jones and Ms. Pereira. Well, as, as the, let, let me move two amendments and see if they will help. That we add a sentence that says the CREST program will be independent and separate from the Amherst Police Department and housed in a separate location. And that we change the line, the second bullet under CREST will have the following features to read CREST staff will be first responders to nonviolent, non criminal calls. We'll need us. So I move those two amendments. We'll need a second for them. I'll right. second make that one, one amendment. One amendment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let, let, let me go back. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. With, with those amendments to the motion, asking for a second to that amended motion. Second it. I think I actually got two seconds. I think Ms. Pat was also, and Ms. Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, Ms. Pat, just put Ms. Pat down. It's fine. That's okay. okay. All right. Ms. Ferreira and Ms. Pat. Community effort. Yep. That would be in that amended motion. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Let me let me uh, do a, a vote by just give me a high sign or a wave of hands so I can recognize all those in favor of that motion as amended. Uh, I see Mr. Vernon Jones. I see Ms. Um, Ms. Owen, Ms. Ferreira, Ms. Bowman, Ms. I think I see Ms. Walker. Do you have your hand up, Ms. Walker? Yeah. Ms. Pat. I got everybody. Ms. I do it all. Mr. Cage also voted yes. Is that you, Mr. Cage? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Cage, Ms. Bowman. Okay, so the, the motion as amended is, is passed. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones. One, this motion didn't attempt to include everything, but okay. we were trying to at least mention everything that might need a budget allocation. But one of the things that's not in there is the um, civilian oversight board. Uh, and I don't know whether we need a motion, but uh, I was hoping that we might, at least through some sort of consensus or agreement, indicate to the town manager that we do want funds in the budget uh, for a civilian oversight board. Well, it is in the motion, though. It's number two. Oh, it is number two. It is. Yeah. Maybe that maybe that takes care of it. Then. Like, yeah. It's just that I, I don't think it's in the budget though. In the budget that I saw that Miss uh, Pat and um, and Miss Walker and Miss Owen worked on, but that we could obviously you know put that together. But yeah, it's in the motion. Okay. All right. So we're in agreement that we we need some budget allocation mm -hmm. for that. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, I want to just and I and I'll go to you, Miss Pat. I think you had your hand up, and Miss Walker for. Uh, after you, but just want to acknowledge the fact that too, uh, there's a lot of information that came around the budget side of this um, from uh, Ms. Pat and others, and uh, they did a lot of work beyond the, beyond uh, this committee to solicit information and input from folks. Um, there are folks that you, you don't probably see. I mean, I know Mr. Cage was involved. Ms. Pat, you can help me with that. Yeah. Other folks who. Uh, we had some community input. So this was not an idle kind of thing, but there was a lot of feedback to this. And, and there, there is a place for us to, you know, I, I think to really talk more about this, certainly because it has implications for the budget. And I, I don't want this to, you know, sort of fall by the wayside and not get the attention it needs from the, the community safety working group. Um, Ms. Pat, you had your hand up and then Ms. Walker. So I just want to mention very quickly, I know we don't have time tonight to discuss the budget, but um, Ms. Ferrara, we did uh, discuss the oversight, uh, Civilian Oversight Commission Board, and we're recommending some sort of 
stipend uh, for whoever, you know, the town manager, you know, appoints. So we're recommending 10K for each member, for um, five member commission. And um, A was also suggested, we worked closely with the seven gen as well in developing uh, the budget in general. So yeah. I just want I to- actually, I actually did see that. I just forgot. Thanks, Ms. Pat, for bringing yeah. it up. Ms. Walker. Um, thank you, Mrs. Pat. I was actually going to say the same thing that we did. Um, so it, thankful for um, the work of Mr. Vernon Jones and Mrs. Owen, they got us this uh, motion very quickly. And yeah. so we had this with us when we went and made our budget recommendations. And so we, we made sure to discuss every single line in this proposed motion. And there is allocations for every single thing in our budget. Yes. Agreed. And I, I want to also add, um, and I'm glad we're, we're coming to this confluence of agreement around this because there are, you know, I, I don't want to be ignorant of the fact that um, we are working with our um, uh, our consultant group, Seven Gen uh, Movement Collective, and these folks are, you know, they're they're out there working 24/7. Um, I see at least one of them on, on the line right now. And I, I think our next step is to really engage a converse, in a conversation with, uh, with them about how we can merge this information, merge these motions and the direction we're taking as a, as a group. In, invite certainly and include and hear more from them about what's going on in the community because that's an important piece that's happening right now. And also, we just recently received uh, a pretty extensive report from them, which needs to be read by everyone here. So um, that includes a lot of different information. I think at this point, as we're having reports becoming, coming due, we have a responsibility to deliver something to the town manager that we have this conversation at some point very soon, even if it has to happen before um, our next meeting. And even if it, it may not include all individuals, but I, I feel there's an important coordination and collaboration effort that needs to happen to, to bring this together so that we can get a coherent and meaningful report uh, uh, to the town manager. And so I'm, I'm saying that out, out loud only because uh, we have some deadlines coming up. I think ours is, you know, I guess, what is it, uh, Mr. Bachman, May 15th, you're expecting it to get something from us. And at the end of April, we're expecting to get something from the, from 7Gen, is that correct? Right. Is that a yes? So um, just saying, saying that, and you know, next week, well, it, it, it's the 28th, and I don't know how much time that gives us, but certainly we have to have some conversation that we're, we, we can come together at least on the 28th and have something about ready to submit to um, to the town manager. Uh, so that's the context I'm presenting, and I, I'd like to hear from folks to see if um, you know what, what your thoughts on that are as well at this point. Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just reading what um, um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Chavez and, and Seven Gen sent to us, um, the, their kind of update, and they're just saying that they're, they're going to give us a, a draft by the 23rd, which would be this Friday, um, but that they would want us to um, provide some feedback to them uh, beforehand. Uh, so they want some feedback by the 25th. So that would be this Sunday. Um, by 8 p.m. 
so that then um, they can present to us, they can have something for us on the 28th, a presentation for us by the next meeting so that they can finish the report by the 30th. So I think those are the important things for us to kind of be mindful of, and make sure that we're giving them the feedback. Uh, that they Ms. Pat? So a couple of things. Uh, I don't think one more meeting next week, Wednesday, will be sufficient for us to be ready to submit something. So I think I will very much, I hope we're planning to invite Seven Jane next week, Wednesday for them to do some sort of presentation for us. I'm almost thinking maybe we should have one additional meeting next week as well. I, at least to discuss the budget, uh, to make sure that everybody is on board or if they have suggestion or changes. But to jam both Seven Gen um, presentation and the budget for one night for two hours is unrealistic. We need to do this right. And for people to fully understand uh, the work that has gone into everybody working so hard. So that's not my two cents I want to put in. <clears throat> Other comments, Ms. Walker, and I have a couple of close comments to make. Ms. Walker. I just want to agree with Ms. Pat. Thank you. Oh, that was easy. Very easy. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? So, so um, can we, as a group, agree to get into that time frame and give the, those folks the, the feedback they need in order for them to have a, a conversation with us on Wednesday? Thumbs up. And I think that conversation would be in, in addition to a conversation about the, the work that uh, the people did on the budget for next Wednesday. Question, Ms. Ms. Walker or? Okay. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, I have no problem with the deadline for getting feedback to seven gen. I'm just wondering, is it just that we each will review it on our own and send them personal feedback? I think and Ms. Ms. Moyson can advise us on that if if there, you know, it, it has to go through some particular funnel here for us. And, uh, and I think we have to funnel this information to them in a timely manner. And uh, Ms. Moyson, would that go to you per individual person to, um, to 7Gen? I think the important piece there is that it's done individually versus hitting reply all. If you could CC me, that would be great. Any objections? Oh, if I send Mr. you some feedback, how do you want to receive it from me? What? Um, I'm if sorry. I have, fee if I I have feedback, I'm going to be very clear. If I have feedback for 7Gen, what's the path? You send it to them and CC me. Gotcha. Okay. Just want to be clear. Yeah. And I have a question. Ms. Pat. When you say send it to them, are you saying send oh, it to send Dr. It. Dr. Kate? Katie? I think you should use seven, seven gens. gens. Seven gen. Okay. And we would expect to receive that, you know, as, as quickly as as you can, but they want it by what? When do they want it by? 8 p.m. on Sunday. 8 p.m. on Sunday. So it's Wednesday now. I, I would encourage us to get that to them as well before Sunday. <laughs> Put it that well, way. They're going to give us the draft on Friday. So we got to wait for the draft. Right. Yeah. So if you can get it done, you know, earlier than Sunday, I, I, I know it's a big demand on this committee, on this group, but uh, given it the, the demands we have. So if we can agree that we will do that and get it to them by Sunday as they requested, let's um, get that response and CC that to Ms. Moyston. I want to go back to the budget piece mm -hmm. um, that uh, Ms. Pat, I want to roll back to you and others who have worked on that. What is your expectation on, around the, the budget piece of that? 
So the way our meeting has been going, if we are having seven gen come next week, Wednesday, I'm just concerned that we may not have enough time to answer people's questions around the budget or even present what we worked on. I'm almost thinking that we need additional meeting before we submit whatever to, to, the, to the town manager. You know, some people may want us to tweak the budget, like, oh, wait a minute, did you think about this? Did, you know, things like that. So I just want people to fully understand the budget, our reasoning, what we, you know, what we did before we put it together, and if people have suggestions. But if people are okay to just rush through it, we just submit it to the, to the town manager then, if that's what people want. But I'm thinking we should have another meeting next week in addition to the Wednesday meeting. In addition to the Wednesday meeting. Yes. Ms. Walker? Um, I Ms. agree Burr. with, oh, sorry. Thank you. I agree with Ms. Patches once again. And I wanna say that um, there was a lot of meticulous thinking and planning and other documents that we used and analyzed in order to come up with the budget. And so I think that upon first glance, it's a little bit hard to figure out what's going on and that it may even be helpful for us to give like somewhat of a budget presentation as to how we came up with the numbers that we came up with, because it's not very clear just by looking at the papers. We did try to add notes so that you guys had some type of idea about the conversation we had while going over the budget. But I think that it would be very helpful. And then I'm also just wondering in terms of the budget, if we would present it in a motion also to the town manager or how we are passing that through. Um, hold on one second. I just got sidetracked by a screen here. There's a lot in that. I, I had a chance to, to scurry through the, that, the, those spreadsheets and everything. There's a lot of information in there and not only to be read, but to be understood. And I, I do know from uh, some conversation with folks that there are questions about why this as opposed to that. So, um, we're going to need some time to to work with that as as a working group. Um, what would Miss Walker, Miss Miss I don't know Miss Pat, and others, Mr. Cage, what what would work to help us get to that point? What would work for you in terms of meeting and getting feedback to help with that point? And I'm I'm seeing you in the corner of my screen, Mr. Bachman, because I'm thinking about we have to come up with something by May 15th to you. So I wanna be sure that we're, you know, we're well ahead of that mark. Um, comments, Mr. Bachman. So the May 15th is a deadline for the full report. So okay. that you, you'll take, so that, that's the time frame. Um, so I just wanna make sure that, that, that that's what the report is, but the budget is submitted on May 1. Right. Right. Okay. So that, so that's. Yes, Ms. Pat. So that's my concern. So I know we're already putting in a lot of time in this uh, group. If people feel that like their schedule is very hectic next week, if it's easier for people to send questions to Ms. Moyston and forward to our committee, we can try to respond. I'm not sure if that's the most efficient way of doing it, but I just want people to feel comfortable and that they understood the reasoning why we did the budget. The only way I can think of is for us to have, even if it's an hour, an hour meeting, or if people are willing to stay till 9 p.m. on Wednesday, I can compromise. We can do a three hour that day. It will be a long night. Hmm. No, you're, you're, you're my hero. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, 8.30, yeah, did I say, uh, I want to go to, I want to recognize, I, I see a hand raise um, from Ms. Ferreira and then Ms. Walker. I think I got that the right, it's there are a, lot of, a lot of screens going on here. If I'm not correct, you can switch places, but Ms. Ferreira and then Ms. Walker. I think it was Ms. Walker. Did you want to go first? That's fine. Yeah, I, I, basically I'm just saying whichever one, I think it, we should do like an hour meeting um, at least um, and you know, either figure out a day or just tack on the hour afterwards. I'm fine either way. 
Okay. Um, I agree okay. with Ms. Pat and Ms. Ferreira. Um, so I think we need another meeting for the budget because uh, May 1 is next Saturday. Definitely. So I honestly believe that if we can't add an extra hour onto our Wednesday meeting, it may be helpful for us to do a Monday or Tuesday meeting for an hour because what I think would be helpful is that if we can present our thinking behind the budget before asking for questions and feedback from the group, and then that way we can make changes or edits to the budget, and then it can be finalized and ready for Friday, which is when we need to have it to Mr. Bockelman. Um, so I think that we need to figure out which one of those options will work for everybody. I think he needs it sooner, but when do you need it, Mr. Bockelman? Yeah, that's, that was good. Thank you, Ms. Ferrer. That's what I was gonna ask the same thing. Yeah, so I tonight was the night that, I, you know, this is where you know, the motion was tonight which is what you voted and that's that's you know that that document is what you know we are in the final throes of the budget we're into the formatting almost we, we i was waiting we were waiting for this action tonight for you um which is and which i think is really great it includes all the content that you've talked about and so with that we'll be we're you know at this point we're moving into formatting stage of the, of the budget it's walker um, and w with those comments, I propose we just pull up the budget right now and go over it. Say that again. I think we should just pull up the budget right now. I know it's late, but I don't know. Can we have a meeting on Friday? Uh, like, I don't understand if they're saying he needs it before then and they're already in the final stages of formatting. I just don't know. When, when what, do you need it, Mr. Mr. What Martin? Are options are. Uh, when? So, um, so uh, we are literally finalized. I was going to take the motion tonight and we yeah. were going to work tomorrow to take, and, and, you know, I, I have been following you. I know where you're, where you're headed yeah. on this. So looking at the elements that you voted tonight and say, how do we address these um, tomorrow this week? You know, we have, we're literally moving into formatting stage on Friday, you know, so. Um, oh, wow. But I think you know I, I have the documents that you have that you have, oh, okay. and um, uh, you know. Here, here's my here, here's my question, and I'll go to you, Mr. Pat. We just received um, through a lot of work, and this this is you know it it, it came in when it came in uh, a lot of work on on folks working on numbers relative to this. As a group, we had not have a time to process this as a group. To, there are questions about even some of the stuff that we, we have information we've collected. Um, and I think therein lies the need for maybe another conversation. That's one thing. Um, I think we, we have a, a, a response that we have to make to the uh, seven gen by Sunday, with respect to what the, what what they they need. Um, for me, and I'll speak for myself. I saw this information. I do have some questions. I I I do want to take more time to. To, to look at the detail of these, the, the budget information that was sent to us. We just recently got it. Um, I'm thinking that we need another meeting, certainly with the budget numbers to have a, a coherent conversation with our community service working group before we just sort of just pass up on, on you know, kind of willy nilly to, to meet a timeline. So, well, that, that, that's my comment. And let me go, let me try to get these in order. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms. Ms. Bowman. Ms. Bowman had her hand up. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I it's hard a lot of the screen get them out of order. Ms. Ms. Bowman. Okay, so, um, We need to look at the budget tonight. If you go back and look at last week's meeting, we agreed to have that 
done for today. So if people who looked at the budget already have questions, then you need to present them tonight. We cannot be holding other people up because we're like, we voted on it last week and, and, to, and we had people working on it so that it could be presented to us today. And if we have questions, like none of the numbers are solid, but the but numbers are there. And the numbers, like it, if you wanna vote against it, vote against it. We don't need to be, we don't all need to agree on it. But I think we need to present, see what's being presented to us at this point, because we are him and hawing constantly every week, him and hawing and pushing things aside and pushing things aside. But you know what? Mr. Brockelman has a date, the deadline, and he's at the end of his deadline, and we're not going to hold him up. We're not going to hold him up. And I, I, I feel like we need to, I, like, I want to call to mo a motion saying that, like, I want to hear the budget right now. And I don't usually stay on these meetings past 7.30 because I do have a family to attend to, but I don't have time to wait more days and I don't have time to see this budget not get put in to what's going to, to the town committee. Like, what are we doing? This, I don't, I don't, I'm, that's my vote. I do not want to wait any longer. Let's hear what the presentation is. We can talk about details later. At least, like, I don't care if the number is exorbitant and crazy. I'd rather put that number in there and then we can discuss, like, because we need them to come back with something. We can discuss why, you know, okay, why was this? Why was that? Why was the other thing? That's fine. But we need to put, like, we need to put the numbers in. We need to put the numbers in. Like, it, what are we waiting for? I don't understand why there's we're, we constantly are waiting for something. We're holding other people up. And we said we're trying to push things through. We're trying to make things happen and we're not making things happen. And this is this is this is where I feel like the disrespect comes in because my time is being wasted and people are making doing things and 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 taking their time to spend extra efforts and this it's completely disrespectful to vote last week to have it read today and then not read it today especially when it comes to something that's already time sensitive. So please, my vote is to read this now. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. I have a question for folks. How many have, uh, of us on the committee, I wanna be very frank about this. How many of you have had a chance to, to read through the budget information that was presented by our subcommittee who did the work on this and have some uh, questions or comment about it and understand what the, the content and trajectory of that, that budget proposal, those budget informations, what, what the content and trajectory of what that budget per, budget uh, analysis may mean for our proposal. How many of you have honestly looked at that and had a chance to analyze it and look at it? Okay, I'm, I'm just asking because I think this, I'm going back to Ms. Bowman's comment um, because this this may have some impact. I, I I'm I'm raising my hand. I've had some opportunity to do that, but I have questions and I have concerns about it. So I I just want to be sure that if that's something we're going to do, you know, we need to do that. You know, fine. I want us to be in, have informed commentary about this. I don't want us to be just saying like, "Hey, we're just going to do this because it's, it was presented to us." These folks spent a lot of time doing this work. Spent a lot of time looking at it, and there's there's some very discreet issues in there. And I know people have comments and questions about it. I want to uh, uh, welcome uh, Ms. Ferreira's comment. Uh, question, or comment. Well uh, Mr. Uh, Jones, Vernon Jones had a, his hand up, and then I'll go after him. I'm not doing good with this. Given, I, I, I think I. Given what Mr. Bachman has said about his timeline, I think uh, Tashina is correct that we, I would propose we take a five minute break and come back and spend 30 to 45 minutes tonight uh, on this. Our goal may not be to come to unanimity about every number but to have a general sense of this that we can pass on to Mr. Bachman. If that's the consensus of the group, I'd be willing to do that. I, I have to not only take a five minute break, but I have to defer to another meeting at eight o'clock. 
Oh, okay. That's how, that's how my schedule works. I, I apologize for that, but then I can come back. But I can, I've got a couple of computers, so I can leave this one open. <laughs> <laughs> it's that, it's that life. I'm sorry. But if that's the, the, um, the intent of the, the uh, consensus of the group, I can come back to it. But I, I do have to step away for a minute to extract myself from another commitment that I have. Ms. Ferreira? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I'm good with that. So what do we want to do? Like, we want to do, you know, five, 10 minute break and then come back. And I, I, I would just say, let's just be concise though, you know, like, like let's have like a half an hour, you know, do the presentation and then, and then, you know, let's try to keep it to half an hour as opposed to 45. Cause like, we all have families. I have my two boys that are, you know, are down there <laughs> downstairs waiting for me. So, um, that that's my only plea. Um, so what are we doing so that we have? So is Miss Miss Owen going to guide us through this next piece? And what are we doing so that we can have the leadership? Let's move forward. Miss Owen, hi. <laughs> hi. I know I've been really quiet this meeting. I think it would work the best if we pulled up both of the spreadsheets and went line by line. And if any members of the um, working group have any questions, we can raise it there. And then we can defer to the um, budget meeting notes at the end if there's any lingering questions. Are we taking a break though, Ms. Ms. Owen? That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it works How for long? me because I have some. I have to. I have to. What, whatever works best for you all. <laughs> Five minutes. It works for me. So eight o'clock. Can, can we get back by eight ten? What time is it? Eight o'clock. Can we come back by eight ten? I'm just going to leave my screen open here. Yes, they are. I've got to. I've got to make a a a shift here to, to to come back to the speeding. But let me just say, ten minutes. If I'm not back. On the screen in 10 minutes, um, Ms. Owen, do you, you, you feel comfortable? Yeah, of course. I will pull, I'll go look for the spreadsheet so I can pull them up on screen share. Oh, I have them already oh, okay. up. Oh, okay. The yeah. ones that um, CSW Budget Subcommittee Crest Program Estimate yeah, of yeah. Cost. Yeah. And same as Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Estimate of Cost. Yes. Yes. That's I got them. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Bachelman. You need me here for this section of the, of the meeting? Yes, please. If you don't mind, it'll be good. <laughs> that would be good. I think in, in I know it's I know it's a long day for you and Miss Marston. Yes, please. Oh, we live for this. What are you talking about? <laughs> you don't have any other life. <laughs> really, you don't. Think it's a long day for for Mr. Bachelman and Miss Boyston. All right. We'll see you at eight ten. I know. Okay. Eight ten. Okay. 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 I'll see you in ten minutes and. Um, Thank you.
Back. Hi. Oh, it is that. Uh, <coughs> we're back. Ready when you guys are. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. I'm going to turn on my camera for a minute while I eat. But um. Okay. Um, I don't know how many people are still are back, but I really feel like the conversation with the PD was getting really good, and I think that they were really receptive to that. So I really. Um, feel like we should at another time after we get through all of this craziness but before you guys leave have another one of those because I think that they were really receptive to the things that you were saying and I felt like the conversation was just really getting good and then we had to break for something else so I just wanted to bring that back Um, do you want me to pull up the spreadsheet, Ms. Moisten? Oh, I can't hear you. I have it here. Sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, which on? one? Which Are we one? on air? We never stopped recording. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. I, I, I want to see the, uh, the picture. That's beautiful. Ms. Bowman's picture. <laughs> Can you see the screen? It says it's paused. Oh, I can still we, see it. And, and guys, I'm going to eat a little something. So I'm going to go dark, but I'm still here. I'm listening. Okay. Do you guys want to do the um, Crest program first or the second part of our recommendations first? I think we should do the budget itself first, if, if that's okay with people. No. Is this the correct one? It is the correct one, yes. Okay. So um, I will start. I was I will start and um Ms. Uh, Ms. Walker and, and Ms. Owen, you can jump in anytime you want. So so basically, in order for us to develop the budget, um we kind of um did some research on Indeed and some salaries across the state. And then we looked at the town current um, salary scale and made some comparison. And we decided to go with the town um, salary scale, even though that will go up in fiscal year 2022. If I'm going too fast or people want to stop me, please do so. And so that's how we came up with the salaries. But as I go on, we can also discuss our reasoning. So we, um, this is the, oh, I thought we are looking at the crest. Can we, can you show, can you show the crest one first? Let's start with that one. I just want to acknowledge um, uh, Ms. Walker had her hand up. Um, Thank you, Ms. Ms. Um, Owen. That was actually going to be my comment was going to be that we should start with the crest budget. Yeah, yeah let's start with crest. So can you tell me which one do you see? Because I have two screens and, and the stuff oh, is do. bouncing around. And so, okay. I, mm -hmm. so we have the, uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion okay. budget. But we want to start with the responder. OK. Yeah. It's just because I have the. Do you see it now? Nope. Oh. Do you see it now? We still have the diversity one. Is that what people are saying? Now? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, can you make it a little bit larger? Okay, as I mentioned before, um, the, the proposal, the, the one that uh, the town manager submitted to us, I believe last week, stated half time, uh, 20 hours of uh, program director supervision. And we felt that a 24 hour program needed a full time. And so we didn't change the salary scale that the um, town manager 
wrote last week, all we did was just um, move the part-time to full-time and that's how we arrived at 85,122. Okay. Uh, the next, is somebody doing like pointer so that people can follow? Thank you. Any questions about the first one? Okay. Any question about that before I move on to another one, to the next one? Okay. And then um, we felt that this work is going to be very stressful and therefore there has to be a supervisor in each shift um, when the two responders will be working. So basically there will be three staff on duty at all times, 24 seven. And so that's how we came up with, the, uh, with that position. And this is just a proposal. The level um, and the step six is something that we pulled from, from the town salary scale. And then the six full time, the next one, please. The six full time is already what uh, the town manager proposed last week. So we didn't make any changes to that. And then we felt that, um, that a huge program like this need an administrative assistant. We are calling this program a department of its own, independent from the police. And therefore they have to have uh, a full-time administrative assistant. And, and so that's, you know, we looked again at the salary scale and this is what we came up with. Nothing is definite, you know, the town manager has the final authority to make changes to the salary, but this, this is just like a guide. Um, and then the one that the town manager presented last, um, gave us, uh, sent to us, didn't include dispatchers at all. Again, we felt that, um, Dispatchers also need supervisor during the shift just to prevent burnout and uh, um, high turnover to retain uh, staff. And so we put in uh, three full-time uh, shift supervisors. The next one um, will be six, just the same uh, staffing pattern like the responders. So we have nine, uh, Altogether, nine full time um, dispatchers and nine full time responders, some of who are our supervisors. And then, when it came to health insurance, I have sent everybody um, where I got that, where we got that from, from the, from, uh, the town website. And um, I we, I, you, we use the same um, town cost for full-time employee to uh, multiply it by the total uh, 10 employees. So we have the, the program director, and then we have the nine um, responders, and then we have nine um, dispatchers. So that's how we came up with, with that. And then Employer con contribution to pension. I actually uh, reached out to the town manager over the weekend about the formula they use, and he was able to uh, give it to me. Um, Twenty-three percent between twenty-three percent and twenty-five percent of each full-time employee salary, and so we figured it out to be this amount. Next, please. And then Medicare. Um, that is a percentage. Um, that was being that is used to come up with this amount and then uh with the furniture so we assume that the town will provide space so there is no budget for rent rental expenses or utilities um we did not change the the numbers the fifteen thousand is what um i believe the town manager had in his own uh, proposal so we didn't change that However, the next one, please. The 50K, we had to increase it because we considered the recruitment. If we're really going to get diverse um, staff uh, to this program, we have to do, um, it cost money to recruit and to train. And so we had to increase the amount to 50K. Um, 
the, the one that town manager uh, sent to us says one vehicle, because this is a college town and um, we have students, students will be accessing uh, press uh, services. We felt that one vehicle will not be enough on a busy night. We have to have more than one vehicle. And that's how we came up with two vehicles. And then supplies and other expenses, we put it um, for 30K. Our thinking around that is that um, some of us remember, you know, uh, attending a webinar where it, a retired chief police in Georgia State, I believe, stated what his office um, uh, was doing, uh, like if they stop a motorist who has a headlight out, instead of writing ticket to that person, this is an example, they will rather send them to a mechanic to change the headlight. So the idea of increasing supplies and others, when responders are doing their work, maybe that would be like out of pocket expenses they might do when they encounter some people. So we, we kind of, you know, wanted to make sure that it's enough funding to like pay for certain things that is not, Maybe sending people, yeah, whatever. Um, Bowen and uh, Alicia, if you guys want to, you know, talk about the, some of the reasons why we put some of the money in there. So the one thing that I just want to say is I, the one thing that I really stand by is there being two vehicles, just because I did see that UMass Amherst is going back full time next semester. So I do think that we have to make the budget for this program, assuming that there's going to be an influx of 22,000 students who are probably going to use CRESS. So these numbers might look a little high to some people, but there's an influx of students coming to Amherst that are also going to use the program. So, so we can't, thank you. We came up with 2 million, a little bit over 2 million. Actually, we're very conservative about it because, you know, again, you know, Amherst as a college town, I think the budget will even go up, but this is a, a good start, you know. Also, another thing that we considered in putting this project together is that most of the calls that the, that the APD gets are nonviolent calls. And therefore, we'll be do, uh, Chris will be doing most of the, of the work for them. And we felt that um, the police budget needs to be cut in order to fund uh, the program because they wouldn't be doing some of the work there that they're currently doing, like the mental health, like homelessness, um, just non-violent non uh, uh, activities. So that's how we, we came up with this. Any questions? Uh, Ms. Ferreira has her hand up. Yes. Oh, thank you for the presentation. That was very um, clear. And thank you to all of you for putting all of this work into things. And also, obviously, for the motion to Mr. Vernon Jones and whoever else worked on that. But in terms of the budget, and, and just want to make sure I'm on the same page, for the um, dispatcher supervisors and the dispatchers, so basically it would be one dispatcher supervisor and two dispatchers per shift, right? That's correct. Assuming yes. three shifts? Three shifts? That, that's what we assumed, that okay. it would be eight-hour shift. Okay. Okay, perfect. That's right. yeah. Thanks. That's what I, I just wanted to make sure I was on the same page. All right. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Pat, I have a question. Yes. Um, and this a, a little bit of a subjective thing, and I don't need to go into it if people don't want to go into it. But what are we thinking about in terms of what is a violent as opposed to nonviolent um, need for response? So that's where you know training the dispatchers will be very criti uh, critical. Um, Hopefully, you know, if the dispatchers are very good question, if the dispatchers are trained like properly, they will be able to uh, figure out if this is a call that the responders should take or if, if, it's, if it's a call that the police should take from the call. Understood. And, and, and I think part of, you know, in terms of how the, the mechanics of it, I, I hear what you're saying. Thank you. You know, that, that explains it to me because that is a very discreet entry level response. 
because um, in some cases, something may start out as a, a nonviolent particular thing, and then it could escalate either by external forces escalating the incident or it's misinterpreted. So just to be clear, when our group was working on this uh, 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 numbers, we weren't saying that um, press would not collaborate with the police or EMT. You know, press will still do that, but it's an independent department. So if like say student party escalates to fighting, of course they have, you know, um, the responders, you know, can get a uh, backup, you know, call the police to, to help. We're not saying that they have, you know, they wouldn't be collaborating with the police if it's a violent situation. We wouldn't be risking people mm -hmm. um, to, to deal with violent situations. Thank you. Um, Ms. Walker and then Mr. Russ Vernon Jones and then um, I think Ms. Moisten. Hard to figure out, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's sort of like you're looking at these things going off and on, but thank you for doing this. Keep going, Ms. Owen. You're doing good. Um, thank you. So I just wanted to add, um, we did talk about um, things in respect to Mr. Wiley's question and how we're going to like indicate which calls are violent and non-violent and which calls will have to go to the CREST program. Um, and I think that that is something that can be worked like that is independent of the budget, what kind of calls will go to them exactly. But I did take a look at the police budget, like I said earlier, and the types of calls they received. Um, and like, if we decided that we were going to send CREST program people to motor vehicle violations or community outreach, like would they be performing these things in place of the police? Because the number one thing that police receive calls for are motor vehicle violations. The number two thing is community outreach. The number three thing is disturbances. The number four thing is reports of suspicious activity. The number five thing are medical assists. The number six thing is for summonses and arrest warrants. And then for the number seven thing was to assist a citizen. And so all of the top reasons our police are being called are reasons are things that can go directly to the CREST program. None of these are violent offenses and they can all be handled. If things escalate, if there are weapons, then that requires further assessment, which is why no. the budgets for the responders, we raised them because they need to have specific training to deal with these things. We're not just sending anybody out there. These people will be trained and they will be able to deal with these things without weapons. And so that is the point of not having the police be there. Mr. Vernon Jones. Was there a level of calls that you assumed in deciding that this was the quantity of dispatch service needed? So that, that's a good question. So this, this um, because we put together, um, I mean, we thought about the students, but with the COVID, we really that, you know, we know the students will eventually come back. When students fully come back, definitely this budget will, you know, will go up because the need will be greater. Did I answer your question? No, I, I just wondered whether you made any <clears throat> numerical estimates about how many calls a year the CREST program might get, for instance. Well, uh, from what Ms. Walker has just mentioned, um, you know, gives us an idea um, of how we put the, um, the staffing together. It's not perfect, this is just a suggestion. Yeah. But I will imagine that as more students come back, we will definitely, I mean, the police, um, the APD has like 44 police officers and we're only talking about 10 employees here. I will imagine it will go up because most of the calls that the APD are getting is what Crest will be doing. But I, for a start, you know, this is what we came up with. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at, you know, it might be up to 20 employees eventually when students come back or even more. If, we, if Chris is going to be do, doing most of the bulk of the work that the police are currently doing. Um, I, oh, sorry. 
Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to also respond to Mr. Vernon Jones and say that um, if you go to the budget from last year, they actually have the complete number of service calls to police listed as 17,483 calls. And I believe that includes when the UMass students are here. So that was for last fiscal year. Yeah. And some near 2,000 of those calls were for me motor or those responses for police were motor vehicle violations, some near 1000 were community outreach, some near 900 were disturbances, some near 600 were reports of suspicious activity. And so those are just the top four things on the list. And as I said before, the top eight things were all nonviolent calls. And so that's just an idea of where we got those numbers for because we expect it to be a large amount of the police calls being rooted to the Crest program. That's right. right. Yep. So, so basically, we're very conservative about this budget. Um, in reality, it should actually be doubled. But because we're on, you know, under uh, pandemic lockdown still, and this is what we came up with. I think Ms. Moisten had a question and then Ms. Ferreira. Yeah. Um, th this is pretty thorough. Um, thank you. So I was just curious. Uh, so when a call comes in and this might, and the only reason why I bring it up in the budget is is because I'm looking at the staffing. Do you send one person out per call or do just two people get sent out per call? We will never send one person out to a call. So that's the whole point of two person out. And you um, then you have the supervisor around in case they need to, you know, um, if they need questions or help or, or support or supervision, whatever. So there will be no situation, hopefully, unless if somebody, even if somebody calls out on their shift, you still have a supervisor that will cover the shift. But hopefully um, one person will not be going out to deal with situation is our thinking. Does that answer your question? It it does, and then I'm just curious, like what happens if there's two calls? And question, like, so, right, yeah. like how do how do we, like do you have? Are you thinking that you're going to work with CSO or or specific PD people? I'm just curious. That's all. Yeah, I mean that also. Um, we thought about that too, but you know, since the students are you know are, are not back, like I reference before this budget you know should go up when you know we have more students in town uh, obviously just um 10 employees for um 10 um nine responders and the program director you know it's not enough to to cover um activities in in, in this town um miss has had her hand up for a while and then miss walker yeah, I mean, I was just um, agreeing with what Ms. Walker and Ms. Uh, Pat um, were talking about in terms of just, I think that this is actually pretty conservative and what Ms. Moisten just talked about, yeah. cases that is very conservative. Mm -hmm. I think we'll probably even need, you know, more like yeah. money for like more responders and yeah. possibly, you know, to, to have in place, not necessarily possibly not more supervisor, we'd have to see, but at least this would be something to give to the town right now. And then they could make an assessment in terms of, 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 of add more, or we could add more, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm good either way. But the thing is, is that I think there'll be plenty of work for them to do because as Ms. Walker has stated and Ms. Pat ha have um, stated that, you know, the police, if we put the, this in place, the police, they're not gonna be responding to this anymore, right? It'll That's be right. this group that will be responding to it and so they, they, you know, their budget gets decreased, their staffing gets decreased, yeah. and it gets moved into this program so that we can make sure that this is, is fully staffed and fully resourced. We're also envisioning that this may not start right away in July because it will take time to advertise, to recruit. I mean, the fiscal year starts in July, but um, to get the word out and also we're also envisioning to have a simple number like people are used to calling 911 people will still call 911 but eventually you know the town manager will have to make a decision to you know I don't know how difficult you know it would be to to come up with like that is a 211 number maybe you know come up with a different you know number where people can call and know that they're calling Chris directly but it's not something that will happen overnight. It might take months. 
um, for people to get used to calling press directly. But calls that goes to 911, some of them can be routed to a press dispatcher. Um, Ms. Bowman has her hand up. Yep. Ms. Bowman. I'm on, I'm talking. Um, yeah, I think that if we're going to, um, if we're going to walk into this with the knowledge that the likelihood is those numbers are going to have to rate, be rate, uh, go up because of the students being here. I think that they're here, what, 10 months, nine months out of the year. We should, that should be, in, that should be inclusive. We should rate, we should even raise the numbers more and raise the number of employees more to reflect the students. And also as part of like, with looking at this budget and the recommendations of this budget, we say, you know, if the town of Amherst doesn't like the numbers, then the town of Amherst should put pressure on UMass police to help in the UMass, the state or whatever, to help fund some of this because hey, we have what, 8,000 students plus that live off campus. That means we're responding to those calls. And so some of that budget should come out of, you know, come from the universities. Um, but I don't think we should, I don't think we should keep, we should stay conservative, conservative on these numbers. Because if we're looking at the numbers right now that may or may not include like if we're looking at the numbers now and we're saying they, that doesn't really include the students, then my suggestion is to say, well, okay, we need to add, you know, two more people on each, in each level or whatever, so that when the students are all here and there are partying in town and having all these like, you know, living in town and having all these breakdowns and crises that are not, or like parties or whatever that are nonviolent, we still have people that can respond to them. And then we don't, because what's going to end up happening is that the students are going to take up all of our resources. They're not, con their, their school is not contributing anything towards those resources. And then again, people in town, specifically the BIPOC community is going to be at the, you know, the end, you know, the, the police end of it per se. You understand what I'm saying? Where it's like, well, We've, we've, re, we've used all of our resources, so now we're actually having to call the police to come in to deal with this because, you know, we didn't staff enough. So we definitely don't want to, I'd rather overstaff and then, you know, I mean, it's like any other negotiation. Oh, you, you throw the number up high and then you get, you can bring it down to what something you can work with. And so... I say, yeah, that's a conservative number. I would even, you know, at least bring it up, you know, I mean, I'd double it personally, you know, cause then we have something to work with. I mean, that's the original initial thinking that we say, let's present this to all of you tonight, uh, you know, to present this and then whatever the group, you know, wants to do, we can tweak it. And then before we submit it to the town manager. Right. Well, yeah, my, my vote is to double it. Um, Ms. Walker. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to state that the numbers or the information that I got from the town budget as to the number of service calls do include UMass students. So that was all calls received by Amherst Police in last year period, not just from the town. I don't think they even organized the data in that way. Um, and so I, I did base it off of all of the numbers for the entire fiscal year last year. And you can see the call, service calls for the last five years and they're all very similar. It's, it hasn't changed much over the last five years. Um, but I am also in support of raising this number. I, I know when we met as a budget team, we all proposed our own drafts and then combined them together to make this draft. Yeah. Um, and my personal yeah. draft had a 16 responder model because I think that when two responders are out responding to a call there needs to be people in the center in case somebody call, comes in in crisis but we are also aware of the budget constraints 
And so I think our idea in presenting it in this way is that this program should be sufficient enough to start. And it's and then the town can say that this is really working and we need to increase the budget, hopefully, because we we already we're, we're already going to have a hard time pushing this number, to be completely honest. We already know they're not interested in giving us this much money. They yeah. quoted us at 700K for this program. So I think that's where our um, our hesitation comes in. Yeah. But I am not against doubling this because I personally do believe that we would need more responders on staff. Also, we don't want to overwork the people that are there if we're going to have the program be 24-7 and only have certain people like we don't want them working around the clock um but but i but i also wouldn't be opposed to leaving it how it is so i i would be interested in hearing more from the group mr wiley thank you uh, um and and thank you for indulging me right now i i moved actually a a training i was supposed to be doing at 8 30. Oh. <laughs> To a little, little little later, so I, to give me some leeway, so I'm going to hang in. But I'm listening to all the conversations we're having, and I I guess I'm. One of my questions is, and, and, and I'm with this conversation all the way around in terms of supporting what needs to happen, in terms of a positive responder response. In this community, that's going to give service, and support, and security, and safety to our bike bike community. I don't want to lose that with within the numbers. I I do want to ask um, the group if we don't know, and I, we didn't get a chance to ask the police department right now, um, because that was one of the questions we wanted to get to at some point. Is where are they willing to, or eager to? or needing to move away from their models of policing into crest models. And I, I think there's a potential there. And I think one of the things about that, I, I, the reason I'm, I'm raising that is that I, I think that um, we have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity to uh, possibly redirect funding from the police department to alternative models of, of uh, public safety, put it that way. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that where they're, they're seeing their particular issues as a structure within a, in the town. I, I think that conversation with them is important because um, I, I do believe there's an opportunity there, and and I think there's an opportunity in the town to do, redirect, not divert, to redirect money into this effort we're talking about to do the the right thing for our community. And I guess my, I I guess I don't know what. what my question is necessarily, but is, but that I su support the work of what people have done around the budget. I support the work around what people have done around crests and everything. And I think there is an opportunity in this community to move in that direction if we do it the right way. And so I'm, I'm hoping that the, the, it's, not, it's not just a number is shifting back and forth that are gonna make a difference. Um, not necessarily about the numbers, but what the, what the ultimate impact, impact is gonna be for our community. I mean, I think that's it. I think there's an opportunity here and we're, we're, we're in it and discussing it. And I think that's, you know, that's a good thing. Um, Ms. Ferreira, Ms. Vern Mr. Vernon Jones, and then Ms. Walker. Yeah, so for me, um, yeah, I don't want the police to have anything to do with anything that we're talking about here. I want it, anything that's non-criminal, non-violent, I want it to be, to go to a crest, which will be an independent. That's why I wanted to be, for us to have that in the motion, independent, with their own space and their own program. 
Um, I think the police had an opportunity to do what they had to do and, and, and they weren't very successful, even with their you know, crisis intervention teams and everything, they weren't very successful. So I don't, want, I, I, I don't want them to have anything to do with this in terms of that. What would only be, I guess, the only thing that I could fathom would be, again, if something that the responders respond to and then it becomes violent and they, you know, and they need backup, I guess, you know, that maybe that could be possibly the only way, place Besides that, I want them to be the ones to respond to situations and not the police. And I don't, ha I don't want them to have any say in terms of how they respond, when they respond, what they do when they respond. It needs to be totally independent, you know? Um, and I want, you know, since they won't be responding, since the police won't be responding, their budget needs to be cut. That's basically it. Their budget needs to be cut so that the money can go to the program. That's, that's where I'm. And so when I'm looking at this, based on all the discussions that people are having, I do think we would need to, and I think it's probably important for us to up the, the money for the um, responders, I mean, the staffing for the responders and the supervisors, because yeah, right now we only have two people per shift, which would mean that if anyone's sick or if there's multiple um, um, incidents happening at the same time, then we would be, you know, in a crunch there, right? Uh, so I think at least we need to at least have um, four people to, per ship, at least. And also people take vacations and stuff like that, so they're going to need people to cover them during those shifts and things like that. So we need to think. So I'll stop. I like this suggestion. I like it. I was muted, sorry. Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Walker. Um, <clears throat> I don't necessarily disagree with what's been said, but I'm trying to watch the time and I think we said we were gonna only go 30 to 45 minutes. I wondered if we could see the rest, if you could walk us through the rest of the budget before okay. we are trying to make changes. Okay, okay. So, okay. Oh wait, Ms. Walker, Ms. Walker. hand up. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I agree with Mr. Vernon Jones, so I'll try to make it quick. I just wanted to say that the police spoke with us, and I think it was helpful to have them speak with us before this because they did let us know that they're on board. I think everything that they said aligned uh, went along with they, they don't necessarily want to be responding to these calls. They want to give us the mental health calls. They want to give us those calls. And so I think I think they'd be more than willing to work with us in terms of turning those calls over to us. And then it would be up to the town manager and the town council in terms of moving the funds that they use to respond to those calls to us so that we can respond to those calls. Um, okay, so the next slide. Do you see it? Yeah, I will be really brief on this. I think Ms. Owen and Ms. Alicia will just explain the reasoning in order to save time. So can you enlarge it a little bit so that other people can say it? Can people say it? Okay. So just like Chris, we, want, we talked about um, having the diversity, equity and inclusion be a separate department in the town, separate. And so um, again, we compared some salary scales and that's how we came up with the, you know, the director it will be a, a huge responsibility. And then we, we, we also discussed about getting an assistant director as well, because it's a department and the administrative assistant, just like all other departments in town, have administrative assistant. And I'm just going real fast. Um, with the youth center, uh, we solicited the uh, input from some youth, including uh, Darius um, Cage. And um, we have to have uh, a full-time um, center coordinator that will be reporting to the director of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And then, Scroll down, please. And then uh, three full-time uh, youth center support services. I'm just like, 
rushing through this because of time. And then um, we also talked about ha having BIPOC cultural center. Um, so the argument will be, oh, we have a MS family center, we have LLC, we have all these uh, social services in town. The problem is that they're not accessible to BIPOC families. Uh, BIPOC families do not get adequate services due to language barrier, due to the, um, the, the, uh, um, the administrators who are non-BIPOC, it's just not working for BIPOC families. So um, we do need a dedicated program for BIPOC folks. Also, it will benefit other residents too, but a place where BIPOC families can go comfortably to seek for help. And yeah, so uh, the cultural center, we were hoping that it will help to promote Bi uh, BIPOC um, culture, um, showcase um, BIPOC museum and celebrations like Ju Juneteenth, Panza, and other celebrations from Caribbean, Africa, you know, um, Hispanic, uh, Asia, ha ha uh, Hawaii, all over. And um, in addition to that, um, let's see, so, you know, I'm just like repeating the support and case management. If people are struggling with paying their, their rent, for example, currently what the town is doing is contracting that service to an agency in Greenfield that is headed by Caucasian and some BIPOC families have been denied um, the service, even though they are qualified to get a rental assistance. So we want that service back into the community. If, if uh, that is a domestic violence, uh, these issues, you know, if, it, if, if some, you know, somebody needs some resources and support that is BIPOC or even anyone, they can come to that center to get some help. And I, I think uh, Ms. Bowen, uh, Owen and um, Ms. Walker can talk more about that. Um, so basically the insurance is the same formula that we used. Um, Ms. Pat, Ms. Walker has her hand up. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, thank you. I just wanted to say that we talked about um, some of the roles in this in this department and in this center. We were hoping yeah. that these can be housed in one building, like a one-stop shop for families and have all of these programs hopefully um, be under the same roof. Um, and then the reason for the salaries and the reasoning for these programs to be separate from other programs that may exist in the town is that we were hoping that all of the staff and um, directors of these programs will have anti-racist training, they will be trained in cultural competency, and that they will um, be trained in trauma-informed care so that they can meet the needs specifically of the BIPOC community. Yes, yeah. And um, so, yeah, okay. I just want to mention that with the youth center, uh, what we got back from uh, the youth, uh, uh, input was that it has to be close to the school, to high school or middle school, like downtown, that it will be easier for kids to walk down to the center instead of locating, the, uh, locating in, you know, far away from, from downtown in order to attract kids to use, to, to access the facility, that people will be reluctant to take the bus. If it's, for example, in North Amherst or, or South Amherst, that people wouldn't go there, that we should try to locate space in town, one of the spaces that was mentioned was the gym at the St. Bridges or something like that. I, you know, you know, for the town to explore that. Anyway, so the employer contribution pension is the same formula that we use for the Medicare. And let's see the. Okay, so the furniture, we felt that with the youth center, for example, um, they might need like gym section, uh, they, you know, they might need more equipment with the youth center so that the kids don't want just one room for everybody to gather. You know, that, that would be like, you know, if people need help with, you know, homework or schoolwork or people just want to socialize and chill out or people just want to, you know, exercise. So that would be separate spaces for that. And we felt that you know it would need more money to do that. And also, of course, with the 
um, the director of the, the entire program need, you know, dedicated uh, space uh, with the, um, yeah, but anyway. So next, please. So same, same logic with the training. It's very important that we just don't hire people and not give them adequate support and funding. That is very critical that there is enough, enough funding to retain uh, staff. Uh, Mr. Wiley. Sorry, I missed your hand. <laughs> no, no, you didn't you did miss it. Actually, you, I, w I was right there. Okay, I'm almost done. So the very, so we felt that this, oh, sorry, I'm almost done. Go ahead. Okay, we, Okay, we felt that um, the, uh, the youth program needs vehicle. The reasoning around that is, you know, with the thinking that the, the program will run from afternoon, like 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, but Saturday, maybe from noontime to six. And in the evening, we don't just want to send kids off if they don't live on bus route. So the vehicle will help to transport kids home. I knew, I know when I was, running my restaurant, I never allowed any of my high school kids to, to take the bus home. I made sure I arranged, if their parents are not able to come pick them up, that they, get, they got home safely. So that's the reason the safety issues. Uh, supplies, celebrations, that's the amount, I'm done. So language, translate, uh, ambassadors, they will not necessarily be uh, town employees, but uh, we will hope that they will be compensated very well when they render their services. So I will let um, Alicia and Brian, Brianna jump in. I would be happy to hear from um, Mr. Wiley or other people with questions before I add anything, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, I'm willing to defer I, I have a couple of minutes i just want to say i had to to move a a, a meeting to nine o'clock that's supposed to happen for me at eight o'clock so um i don't want to lo lose too many friends tonight but uh um if you don't mind miss walker i'll be very brief yeah absolutely as I'm looking at this this thing and and in, in, in its totality, I I, I I believe we're on the right track here. Uh, I I do believe we're on the right track in terms of what we're trying to do with with, with this particular program. And when I, I look at this particular piece, I see if my my count is right, there's probably about ten positions in here that are full time positions that um, probably cross over into other areas of our town and our town government. You know, while we, we may not want to relinquish that responsibility to, to let's say leisure services, for example, but it, it, these are positions that, that, are, that would have to be hired and trained and financed all the way through to benefits and other kinds of things, which is a cost. No problem with that, but to understand that that's, that's what's happening in that area. And I wonder if some of those things might overlap with maybe some of the initiatives that a department like leisure services may be thinking about. Could this be a shared opportunity here? Uh, the, the other piece I wanted to say, and, and I do, I apologize, I, ha I have to get off because I have to attend to these other folks at this particular time. But um, th there's a really strong opportunity for us to do something here, and I, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know how to emphasize that enough at this particular time. But um, if we can get ourselves to a point where we can see that we can propose something that's coherent, concrete and it's gonna have some traction at the town level, then we're, we're gonna do ourselves well. I think if we, 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 we've gotta stay focused, you know, on what our, our mission was and, and is, and, 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 and what our task is before us. And if we can do that, and I think we're there, 
we're on our way. So, um, Mr. Mr. Wiley, I just have a quick question for you before you jump off. I thought we were expanding the meeting to all agree on this motion. If you leave and we all agree on these numbers, is that okay with you or? I have no disagreement with, with, with the, the, um, the intent and spirit of where we're going. So I, I, I do have to go. Okay. So I'm not in disagreement with what, with what we're doing. I'm just saying, I hope we can stay the course around what our, our mission and vision is with respect to the, what the town has charged us to do on you know, going forward. Um, all respect to the people who have done the work on the budget, uh, certainly it's folks who've done the work on the crest part piece of it. And, um, you know, I'm with you. I've supported all the way through as far as I can, I can see it, uh, Ms. Walker. So, I mean, Ms. Owen, so that's, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay, awesome. So, um, so before you leave, if you don't mind, before you leave, Mr. Wiley, what I didn't mention is that this program is prevention. CRES is crisis intervention. This program is prevention. So there is two distinct reasons why we have this. So that's why, yeah, we have prevention for this one, CRES. It's crisis uh, intervention. Understood, thank you. Um, I see Ms. Moisten's hand, then Ms. Walker, then Ms. Ferreira. I'll be, I'll be quick too. So I'm very excited about this because I've had this whole notion in my head somewhere that we could be somewhere like the, the, the Hampshire YMCA is so successful and I understand that they have funding through a different you know, what system. And I'm not saying that it has to be like that, but I just know like the Hampshire Y to some degree works as like that one stop place. And it has all of the community organizations and like these kids need a basketball court and they, you know, they need a, some, some other act, places for activities. So I just, I don't know about a, like the merge, if we can get all of the different youth programs to kind of merge together and work or how you guys would want to do that. But I just, I'm very excited about this piece of it, and I, um, I think that it, it, it could definitely work. And you could utilize some systems that are already in play. As long as, very good point. As long as it's headed by back, uh, BIPOC leadership, that's the whole point of creating this. If BIPOC families are getting the services that we need in this town, we won't have this. So that's the whole point. I don't have any problem merging some of the services as long as it is administered by BIPOC leadership. That's the emphasis. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt, but I nine o'clock was as late as I could push my other commitment. I do need to go. I totally agree that these are things our town needs and really appreciate the work that people have put in. I'm very sorry I can't stay. So should we put a motion or should yeah. we? So let's round this up, yeah. Um, so I see Ms. Walker's hand, Ms. Ferreira, and then Mr. Wiley. It's okay. I'm in favor of moving towards a motion yeah. so that we can get people out of here and I can save my comments for next week. Yep. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, me too. Um, I just want to do the vote, but I also don't want to forget that we, we had also said about possibly um, adding more responders. Should I make changes on that? Should we make changes on that? Good with that. Yeah, I would be in favor of doubling just what we have now in terms of the responders. If that well, is what about we're... dispatchers? Just the responders? No, just the responders for me. Okay. At this point. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wiley. I think my, my, my parting comment is that I, I don't want to um, abandon the fact that there have been our consultant group has been with us through this entire process and they are they are in our community doing work with our community getting feedback and at, at this particular point we have not fully heard from them about what their uh, what resources they found of, or what information they've received from our, our community. And I, I think this is going to be important because it, it will touch on all of these items that we're, we're receiving, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about right now. But uh, as they're spending a lot of time working on this and extended time attending these meetings, and you know, I'm speaking on behalf of them, 
their voice has not been heard, but they're taking in all this information. I, I hope we can facilitate an opportunity to have a conversation with them. Um, perhaps at the next meeting, if possible, um, to hear more from them about what they're finding, because this is going to inform what happens for us on in in May in terms of our our formal uh, response to the, the to the town. So I I want to you know thank them for being here. I know they're on the I know they're on the on this meeting right now, and they're listening, but I, I don't want to dismiss them in this conversation. And um, you know, with that, I'll you know I'll, I'll let it go. I do have to corral about fifteen people right now, so. <laughs> so I can I say something? I agree with Mr. Wiley. I think we should table the motion till next week Wednesday. Well, after we hear from the work of Seven Gen. Yeah, I think but wait should. a minute. But we we can't do that. We though, cannot do yeah, that. We can't do that. We why not? Own it because we cannot do that. The budget by day. By Friday and stuff. So we need to do that. I didn't spend an extra 45 minutes to then table it. No, 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 no. We need to see, not. Yeah, we're voting we on, it on it now. Yeah. I'm not asking. And, and, I don't want to be you know mis what? I don't want to be misinterpreted. I'm wow. not advocating abandoning the motion. I'm just saying I think we have to make space for, for yeah, conversation. but 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 Mr. Wiley, we're gonna do that for the report. That's the whole point. We're not we're not not going to listen to them, obviously, but but that's what I'll be included in the report. But right now we need to make budget decisions. We need to make right, a budget right. decision. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Two different things, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So um, with all of that being, wait, oh, Ms. Bowman, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I was basically, I think I know where you're going, but with all that being said, we need to vote on this. It's after, eight, it's after 45 minutes, we agreed to 45 minutes, I need to go. So can we, can we put this to a vote, please? Um, um, all in favor to motion, should we do the, both of them separate or together? No, let's do it together, but just with the amendment for the responders that we doubled the responders. That's it. That okay. was the amendment. Okay, so I motion to move both of the um, budgets forward with um, the responders doubled to the Amherst population. All in favor, um, raise your hand. And it's seconded too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm really bad at all of this meeting, like the format. I, the I have meeting. a question before we vote, please. It's when you say now. responders, I have a question before we vote. When you say responders, do you mean also the supervisors or just the responders? I think just, just the responders. responders. Okay, got you. Okay. Are we all in agreement of that? Yes. Uh, Miss Walker? Oh, she has her hand raised. Okay. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Okay. Um, let me pull up the meeting agenda. Oh. So, okay. oh. I'm really awful at this. Okay. So, are there any um, events before we close out? Well, actually, so then who's going to submit that though? Who's going to submit it to Mr. Mr. Bachman so we know that that's going to get sent out to him? Miss Pat, the chair, the chair, right? Don't we send it um, to Mr. Bachman and CC Jennifer? Yeah, Miss Pat, why don't you just do it? You all worked on it. Okay, just do it and send it to to Mr. Bachman and CC. Yeah, CC uh, Jennifer. And okay, when do you guys want this sent? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow. I mean, unless you want to do it now. Yeah, unless you want to do it now. <laughs> We've already, I mean, we've already voted on it. Just do I, it. I think like, Ms. Bowman's right. I think, we, I think Ms. Bowman's right. We already did it. Yeah. Then just send it out to him. Yeah. Did we vote already? Yeah. yeah. We, we did. Just don't oh, forget. We did. To, okay. I'm tired. Don't, <laughs> don't forget to double the responders. So. Yeah, I went. All the responders and then send it to Mr. Bachman with a CC to Ms. Moiston. Okay. Perfect. We'll do so. With that being said, is there any upcoming events that anyone wants to share? It just doesn't no. matter. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay.
Okay, awesome. I, I'll, I'll take that as a consensus, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we will email anything that needs to be emailed at this point. And I motion that the meeting is adjourned. Can I adjourn? Yes. Yes, so, so, <laughs> Bye, everyone. So, I'm so, and thank you. Love y'all. Bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you so everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody who came. Have a good night.